Oh, welcome back to Spiro Avenue. Ben, I think we're live. I didn't hear you say anything back there, Ben, but I think we're live. So I'm going to just do the show. And I'm excited. This is going to be one of the best ones in a long time. It's one that has been demanded by the masses. People have been tagging me, tagging this individual, telling me to bring him in. I'm excited. We'll get to that in a minute. But we got to remember who keeps the lights on around here. It sure as shit isn't me, guys. It's the sponsors. So we got to acknowledge them right at the top and thank them. And we will thank them dearly. Virgil's Vineyard. Makers of the Smuggler's Son, my favorite red wine, prominently featured on this show for almost a year now. One of the original supporters of the Spiro Avenue show. They are good friends. It's the best wine, I'm telling you. It tastes like a $250, $300 bottle. It ain't that. And it's even less if you use the discount code. S-P-I-R-O, Spiro, 10% discount code of virgilsvineyard.com. Get yourself some Smuggler's Son fantastic red wine, a favorite of our guests, a favorite of mine. Again, virgilsvineyard.com and use discount code Spiro at checkout for that 10% discount. So like I said, I'm excited and this will be an interesting one. And I want to start here. I want you to come along with me as I paint a picture for you and, and just bear with me as we go on this little journey. So most of you are sports fans. That is the primary demographic. We have my mom, watches the show. But beyond that, it's mostly hardcore sports fans. So I want you to think of yourself as a kid. You were all uh, a kid at some point, just like I was, and probably a big sports fan as a kid as well. So take yourself back to, let's call it like age six. We'll do age six. So you're the six-year-old kid and, and you're the huge sports fan. And your mom is taking you to see your favorite team play. It doesn't matter who the team is, taking you to see your favorite team. And you hop in the car, You're beyond excited for the game. It's a big deal when you're a little kid. And you pepper your mom with all the sort of usual questions. You know, everyone does the are we there yet stuff, but more of the sports-centric ones. You say, will my favorite player wave to me during warm-ups? You know, Darren McCarty used to throw pucks in the stands. It made all the kids' day, right? You know, do you think we'll win, mom? Is the home team going to pull it off? And no matter what happens, good or bad, on the field, the ice, the court, no matter what, you're getting one of those hot pretzels you like, right? So the worst case scenario is still pretty good. So those were fun days. I, you were a sports fan. I was a sports fan. We loved it. So that drive to the game, I always remembered as a kid, was exciting. I loved it. It was one of the best parts. I mean, just the, that anticipation pulling up. You see the traffic backing up. You know it's close. Those were good times. So you know no matter what happens, you're in for a good night. That was the sort of usual six-year-old, eight-year-old, whatever you want to call it, Justin Spiro, casual, common sports fan experience as a kid. I want you to imagine an alternative scenario where you are still that six-year-old kid. Let's just picture a six-year-old kid. Let's just keep it more general. Picture in the six-year-old kid who is also a diehard sports fan, who, in fact, is a diehard sports fan of the same favorite team that you have. You guys have that same team in common. And he's in the back seat of his mom's car going to the same game that you are. But this kid isn't asking his mom about whether or not players are going to wave to him during warmups. This kid isn't pressing mom as to whether or not the home team will be triumphant in the end. And hot pretzels, while delicious and beloved by the six year old boy, uh, they're the furthest thing from his mind during this drive. This boy is asking different questions and he's wondering different things. This six-year-old boy is wondering how big the crowd will be at the arena and if he'll end up feeling trapped while walking the concourse. This boy is wondering if the crowd will erupt during the game's biggest moments and if that cascade of crowd enthusiasm will feel like a bomb going off in his brain. This boy is wondering if he'll be able to remain calm during the many triggering events that await him at events such as this, and if strangers are going to stare at him when it happens and his efforts to maintain composure fall short. These are the questions in some people's heads that were not in ours, perhaps. Welcome to autism spectrum disorder in many cases, where even the most fun, seemingly innocuous, seemingly unambiguous event A fun sporting event for a diehard sports fan as a kid can create an endless stream of anxieties and risk assessment. Do I dare go out in public knowing I am always an instant away from losing any semblance of emotional control? 
And are they going to sneer at my parents, mistaking my outbursts as the predictable result of shoddy parenting? These are the questions that people in this situation often ask. And these are questions that I've never personally needed to ask. Certainly, my my childhood was a lot rosier. These are uh, risk assessments that we didn't have to consider. I didn't have to worry about whether or not people were going to stare at me when I was going to a game as a six-year-old or if this, this noise would be too much for my ears. We just never needed to perform that type of risk assessment, most of us. But tonight, we are welcoming in a person who knows those questions very well. He knows them because he has asked himself these questions throughout his childhood. He knows these challenges that we speak of, and he knows them well because he has overcome them in a historic, admirable fashion. So I'm going to introduce him. He is a former Michigan State basketball player, although that almost seems secondary at this point. Not many people you can say that about where that's like the second most admirable thing on their resume because that's quite a, a start. He's the author of a brand new book, which you'll see over my shoulder shortly. I was supposed to finish it. I'm about 80% of the way through. It's fantastic. It's called Centered, Autism, Basketball, and One Athlete's Dreams. This guy was given a long list of things he would never be able to do, and he did them anyway. He's Anthony Ayani. He is a certified Spartan dog, if there ever was one. Anthony Ayani, welcome to the Spiro Avenue Show. Thanks, Justin. Good to be here, man. It's been a long time. People have been bugging me about having you. I, <laughs> they don't leave me alone. I, you know, I, but that's, the kind, that's a good kind of pressure. You know, People sometimes aren't so nice, as you know. I didn't deal with the same kind of stuff you did, and we'll get into that. But people are not so nice to me sometimes. But they were nice about this, but they said, Enough's enough. I got to get you in. <laughs> so we, we got those back channels going. We were talking. Perfect timing. Your book is just out this mm-hmm. week. I, I got to tell you, I had admiration before. Yeah. I knew your story sort of on the periphery. It's a different level now having read the book. And I think yeah. anybody that reads that, I mean, I'll be honest with you guys. And I'll be honest with you. The first half is tough. Like I, I wanted to like hug the six-year-old you, eight-year-old you, four. <laughs> you started at four. The book starts with you at four. Yeah. Like you, you come out with the book this week. Honestly, I looked around. It, it seems to almost stand alone in its genre. Like there's nothing really equivalent to it. Obviously, the experience of autism has been expressed in, in print before, but just right. your context, D1 athlete for a, uh, one of the 15 most famous athletic programs in the country, yeah. <laughs> Michigan State basketball. <laughs> I mean, this is not, I mean, no offense, this isn't like Wayne State. <laughs> this, is, this is a big deal, you know, in terms of the basketball program. So uh, your story is incredible, but I got to be honest, though, uh, books are a pain in the ass to write. I actually tried right. a while ago. <laughs> I, I quit. I, your book is not just a book. It's like a tome. What inspired you to write this book? What, why write it? What, what was your motivation? So the motivation, Justin, was people getting in my ear about it as much as they could. So about four years ago, I spoke at a middle school in Macomb County. And when I got done speaking, the principal came up to me and said, Hey, have you ever thought about writing a book? Because, you know, I think our students would get a lot more if they just heard, if they read more about your story than the 40, 45 minutes you tell them. And I was like, well, I don't know. Like I'm on the road so much. Like I don't know if I have time to even do it or even think about it. And so, um, so that's what really started kind of turning the wheels for me a little bit. So I was like, okay, well, maybe I can, you know, f- figure something out. So, so Chris Solari, um, when Chris was writing for the Lane State Journal about six years ago, he was doing feel good pieces and he uh, wrote a piece on me and my story. And I called Chris up after that and said, hey, um, what do you think about writing and possibly turning this article into something bigger, like a bigger project? And, you know, Chris really thought about it, but then he was hired by the Freep to be the beat writer for MSU basketball and football. And so, I had to come up with another plan. And so my resource room teacher from middle school, she, she introduced me to her husband's cousin, who was a Michigan State graduate of journalism, and he wrote magazine articles and worked for different publishers. Now, he is, now he's a literature teacher at Wyandotte Roosevelt High School in Wyandotte, and so Rob Keast. So Rob and I got together, and I said, this is what I want to do. I want my entire life story to be out there. And so we wrote the book the summer of 2018, got done with it in the fall. And then before we knew it, we were trying to find an agent for it. So we signed with Joe Perry out of Literary, uh, Perry, uh, Perry Literary Incorporated out of New York. And then um, we signed with IU Press a year later. So, But just a lot of people getting in my ear is what really motivated me. And the other thing too, Justin, was as an autism advocate, like, I, want, I, want, I want to educate people on what autism is. And what I really wanted to hit home with in this book was is to show people what autism really is. 
and what I went through as a kid. Because, yeah, like you said, like you've heard my story, but you only heard like the bits and pieces of it, but you really didn't get into the full details and the full like good stuff of what I really went through as a kid. Because you know, I'm willing to bet that half of Spartan Nation or most of Spartan Nation didn't know about some of the things that happened to me when I was four or five years old. You know, I, I could barely go to basketball games, you know, because just the sounds and the lights of the Breslin Center really bothered me so much, like to the point where I would have my head in my mom's lap. Like I just couldn't control it because it was just too much of an overload for me. So obviously, you know, not just people getting in my ear, but wanting to educate people more about what autism is and, you know, showing and telling people my entire life story is what really motivated me to do this. The thing that was really heartbreaking for me is, you know, I, I sort of have a different experience with autism. You know, not uh, I don't I don't have autism, mm -hmm. but you know I'll get into it a little bit later. It's uh, it's been in my family. Uh, some of my best friends are on the spectrum and have you know sort of varying diagnosis, and it's called the spectrum for a reason. But in my experience, it has been very accepted. I, I went yeah. to one of my good friends growing up through school who was on the spectrum, or is on the spectrum, mm -hmm. and went to a nice school and the suburbs and you know it was treated very respectfully and i'm not saying no one ever said anything but i honestly can't recall a single time and i get into your story and it makes sense because you know kids are mean mm -hmm. but it's just with autism in particular i saw other forms of bullying don't get me wrong but right. it's like that was a category that it was like yeah people are on the spectrum like who gives a shit like it just wasn't a big deal it'd be right. like you know making fun of someone for having brown hair like it just it was not on my radar so reading your story I, I wasn't kidding, man. My heart was breaking for you. I mean, there's, there's cases that you mentioned one, correct me if I'm wrong on the details, but I think you're first grade or second grade and you're on the playground and you're just doing like Lion King quotes. Yeah, it was in first grade. First yep. grade. Yep. Yeah. It, it, you're doing Lion King quotes and just minding your own business, like not bothering anybody. And this kid comes and makes fun of you. And then the brother gets involved. He's older than you. I think he was a fourth and a fifth grader. Yep. And you end up getting chased around the, the playground and they shove you down on the ground. Right. I mean, I think yeah. I, it's just, that is like, you're, you're just off in the corner quoting Disney. And right. it's just, so I, I want to talk like, you know, you mentioned in the book, <laughs> the exact line I think was, I was a really tall kindergartner, but this was, guy was like Andre the giant. I, I said, yeah, that you're was, still that was a the kid. exact quote. Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> and, but you know, even just generally though, you, you had a couple of stories along those lines where it's like, people thought like, Oh, it's this giant guy. Like they, they sort of forget that, you're really young still. Like right. it's, you know, I met my son, both of them actually are 99 percentile, but my son's two years old. People think he's four. So he'll <laughs> act up like a two year old. I, know, I mean, it's not apples to apples, but right. like, people do look at you like, hey, get your four year old in line. It's like, he's two. <laughs> like they all kind of go through this. You know, it's called the terrible twos for a reason. But I mean, that story, like kids can obviously be cruel. Uh, we all saw that to varying degrees. Uh, but to be frank, I mean, your childhood seemed particularly cruel i mean mm -hmm. i i know everyone just knows their own frame of reference like take me into the mind of a young anthony you're this young boy you talked about different stages but you're not fitting in kids see you as a target like what was it like growing up with the, all this baggage going on what's it like just for kids generally in your type of situation it's hard because like at that at that young of an age like i wanted one friend or one thing in which was to have friends and that's what one person with autism wants in their life is they want to have friends in life. And for me, you know, people who know me know that jokes and sarcasm today are my worst. And back then it was even worse for me because I could not tell like, okay, like, is this fifth grader being cool to me? Is he being nice to me? Or is he just like, you know, being mean or and sarcastic? I just can't catch it. So like, I always tried to like be around people and, you know, I thought everybody was my friend. And so, but the six year old me, it was really difficult for me to even like process that because I could not tell, you know, whether the kids were being mean or not, or whether they were just being, you know, joking around. So it was really hard for me. And then like, I go back to the whole piece of the loud noises and everything, like fire drills were my absolute worst. And if, you know, if there was a fire drill today and five-year-old me sitting here right now, I would just freak out. Like I would cover my ears from the noise. I would shield my eyes from the light because I hated all of that. Um, but luckily, you know, I had great teachers that kind of came into play and helped me kind of overcome those things. But just the five-year-old me just had a really difficult time understanding certain situations. And I also had to like have um, like structure in my life. So for example, you know, I think it was talked about in Centered was my mom had to have me on certain set schedules. 
And if those schedules got out of whack, I would have a wig out moment or I would just throw a fit with my mom. And so having that structure growing up, it really helped me. But if I didn't have that structure, I would just get all out of whack and I would just have my wig out moments. I think you had a part uh, towards the beginning of the book. Yeah, I may be playing a little bit with the phraseology here, but you essentially characterized autism, or at least in your case, autism as a blessing and a curse, sort of mm-hmm. a yin and a yang. Uh, you did call it, uh, you called it, quote, a lucky break for you in certain respects, specifically with the rejection that you had of the typical social cue to withdraw in the face of bullying, mm-hmm. which I thought this was really interesting. So I pulled this quote from the book. I hope your publisher doesn't come after me. I hope this constitutes fair use, Anthony. <laughs> so uh, read this. So this book just came out. So I'm probably the only one in the audience that's already read this, maybe a few exceptions. But this was an interesting excerpt. With bullies, I was lucky. When kids are bullied, a common response is to attempt invisibility. They stop putting themselves out there. They stay away from the ping pong table, from the athletic fields, anywhere they might draw attention to themselves. But Thanks to my autism, I didn't have the social sense to try to disappear. I threw myself right into the mix. I found that fascinating. I, I read that and I was like, that's in a way, I, look, I'm not saying it's something, uh, your experience obviously was right. hard in so many ways, but I found that element of it fascinating and kind of an interesting silver lining, if you will. Mm-hmm. Like your autism was a form of Teflon for you? Is that, is that a fair takeaway? Yeah. And, and you know, it's funny that that exact quote you brought up there, I actually had to redo that line because um, I was in Grand Rapids today doing the last session for audiobook recording. So I got to narrate, you know, the audio portion of Centered. And so that was actually, you know, in the script where I had to go back and redo it. And so, but, you know, it's funny, like I read that this morning and then I see it again. And I say, like, you know, it's a blessing and a curse because you know, in that quote where I talk about, you know, some some kids or individuals who are bullied, like they try to stay away from the situation. Like they don't go, they try to avoid that person as much as possible. But me, I kept going back to the same places. I kept going back to those ping pong tables in middle school. I kept going back to the gym. I kept going back to certain parts in the hallways where I knew those same bullies were at. Why I did that, I don't know. I think part of me thinks it's because I'm just a people person. Like I want to be the nice kid. I wanted to, I wanted to, that, that, that old saying, Justin, I wanted to kill people with kindness. And show people, and especially kids in my school, that you know what, you may try to knock me down, but I'm right here and I'm back up. So what are you gonna do next? And I think that was kind of my mentality before, you know, the chip on the shoulder mentality came my freshman year of high school. And so, but at the same time, I say it was a curse because, you know, I would just put myself back in the same situations again, and then I would get hurt again. And so, but at the same time, you know. If I don't have the, if I don't go back to those same situations, I don't have the story. I don't have my life story that I have today. So, but I just found that, I found that quote really interesting, you know, when uh, Rob and I were writing the book and I was like, man, like that's, you know, that's deep, you know, and there's a lot more good quotes in the book too. I don't want to give too much away, but, um, you know, for me to kind of give two sides of having, you know, having autism as a good thing and then having it as a bad thing. You know, I think it really show it'll show the community too. Like, you know what? Like, I've been in your shoes before. I know what it's like, and this is why I kept going back to those situations because it's just who I am. I mean, it, at the risk of sounding trite, I mean, it does. It's sort of the definition, ultimate example of leaning into who you are and embracing right. who you are. Right. And whether it was because because of autism, you were relatively oblivious to. Obviously, mm-hmm. you knew what was going on, but. Like the typical social cue, if every time you go to the swing set is the kids treat you like shit, it's like the social cue is, okay, I'm not going to go to the swing set. Right. Whether it was you were oblivious or just didn't give a shit, I thought that was such a standout part of the book where it's just mm-hmm. like, yeah, they literally shoved me down. And the next day it's like, you know, Anthony's back. Like you, you can call me. It was at the Jolly Green Giant or yeah, whatever. Yeah, when I was in middle school. That yeah, when middle name. school. So you can call me whatever you want. Like Anthony's coming back. Like I don't care. I was reading that. I'm like, man, I got, I got to tough it up in my life, man. Like, it's like, and then, and then the other thing, up. the other thing too, Justin is, and this is part of who I am today. Like there are certain situations where I just can't let go of them, and you know, I get so, you know, I'll get high anxiety over, it, I'll get stressed out over it, but then. Once I talk to like my family or my wife about things and I'll just say like, you just got to do this, do that. Then I'll completely, you know, walk away from the situation. So, you know, a good example, you know, when my dad was at Michigan State, you know, there were certain things, you know, going down at the athletic department or behind the scenes. Like if he got stressed out in a meeting and he told me about it, then I would worry about it. Then I would get stressed out Can about it. Can we quick tell people who your dad 
is and you know, hit the role he served for those that don't know. Uh, Greg Ianni, former deputy director of athletics. Yeah, so he was like number two or three on the athletic org he, chart. He was number two behind Hollis. Yeah, yep. right. So a big deal up there. Oh yeah. So just for those that didn't know, right. most do, those that don't. <laughs> but um, so yeah, then his situation all of a sudden becomes mine, where I shouldn't have to worry about it. I should just let it just roll off my shoulder and I move on with my day. But no, like the person that I am, I get caught up in thinking about those situations and I can't let it go. Or if I get an idea in my head. So for example, like, oh, I want to sell merchandise. I want to do this. I want to do that. How am I going to do it? Well, it's going to be on my mind for a while and I just can't let it go. And I think as a younger kid, when those situations were going on, I didn't want to, you know, I just kept going toward those situations instead of walking away like a quote unquote normal person would do. But, you know, I've learned over the years, like, you know, when you have like the support system you have, whether it's family or friends or teammates or coaches that say to you, hey, just can control what you can control and stay away from certain situations. So either A, you don't get in trouble or B, like the same situation doesn't happen again. It's really helped me out a lot in the long run. So you're 33 now? 32. 32. Yep. Close. But uh, according to Kevin Durant, I probably look older than that. But, oh, whatever. You look good to me, man. <laughs> Thank I, you. I, I, I'm not messing with you. I saw you come in. My wife's like, oh, shit. He's, just, <laughs> I, I, he, he's a basketball player, right? So, yeah, he is. He is. Yeah, he's he's not on the cricket team, honey. Uh, so, uh, yeah, you're, you're an imposing force. But you're 32. Talk about it in the book, obviously. But, you know, not everyone's read the book. It just came out. I do recommend it, though. It's fantastic. Thank you. <laughs> but so, I was very entrenched in the stories of young Anthony. but. Sitting here today, you're 32 years old. Mm-hmm. Obviously, it's not something, it's not an infection. You take penicillin for it, it just goes away. It's always sort of part of the brain chemistry. Right. Uh, what is something today, right now, Anthony goes into this social situation or this type of circumstance that is going to ramp that up? And, like, how do you deal with that? So I'll use social media as a good example or, you know, the lovely message boards we have in Michigan State, obviously. Shout out to the message boards. Um, (laughs) You can shout them out. I I will withhold any shout outs. (laughs) But, um, you know, if somebody says something about me on the message board or somebody tries to take a shot at me on Twitter, then I'll get wrapped up in that situation. Whereas a normal person, you know, would just look at that and go, eh, whatever, you know, words are words. But for me, like if somebody's trying to like disrespect my career or somebody tries to take shots at my presentation when they've never seen me present before, then I get a little offensive. Then I then I'm on the off like the defensive side and trying to stand up for myself. Whereas, you know, I should be like, you know what, don't worry about it. Like if this person has not seen you present before, like don't worry about, you know, what he or she thinks. Cause if they haven't seen it, then don't worry about it. So it's just like the little things like that. Um, you know, another good example is if Michigan State loses, like you know, back in the day, you know, I would have cried about it, you know, because I cried a lot when Michigan State lost because I hated seeing my favorite team lose or any of my sports teams lose. But now, like today, like I'll get angry about it for like 10 minutes. I'll throw a pillow against the wall instead of my cell phone. <laughs> and then I'll just like go into that little zone of just like trying to stay calm and whatnot. But just like, you know, anybody. And, and this is why Justin say I say to people too, like having that chip on the shoulder mentality is a blessing and a curse at 32 years old because like. It's a blessing because it's gotten me to where I'm in my life today. It helped me make history at Michigan State, being the first Division I basketball player with autism. It helped me, you know, overcome a lot of things to get my degree in sociology from Michigan State. I say it's a curse because I don't need it anymore. You know, like, what do I need to prove to people? You know, so if somebody tries to come at me and talk dirt about my presentations, it's like, what do I need to prove that person for? Because, like, I go out and I know what I do impacts at least one person, which is my goal, just to inspire one person every place I go. Because that's all you need in life is just to inspire one person. So I've always asked myself, like, why do I still need that chip on the shoulder mentality? So, and and I I talk about it with my mom, too. I talked about it with her today, you know, with the book, you know. I want my book to be a bestseller. And I asked my mom, I said, am I putting pressure on myself, too much pressure on myself with this? And she thought I was because, you know, obviously the main goal for Center is to educate people, like I talked about. And not to worry about the sales and not to worry about what other people are going to say or think about it. Because, you know, it's about educating and showing that the autism community is capable of doing incredible things despite having major obstacles in front of them in life. I I think you're – let's back up to the social media thing, actually. Let's do it. (laughs) Because I want to jump on that for a second. So we've had about 50 guests on this show in in both iterations, you know, the cameras on and when it was just audio. I've had a lot of polarizing people in here. There's no one more polarizing than me, probably, but I've had some polarizing people across from me. 
I'm actually shocked that you've gotten social media criticism. You're probably I've the least it, yeah. polarizing person I've ever had. I mean, everybody <laughs> loves you. I, I, there's two people that have been on the show. You're now the second that I thought when they sat here, I'd never read a bad word about them or heard a bad word about them. Mm-hmm. It was you and Andy Isaac. But Andy Isaac got into some uh, hot water uh, on Twitter the other day. He, Miguel Cabrera was chasing his 500th home run, and he had the gall to tell his, his audience, which is massive, that if they catch it, they should sleep on it before deciding what to do. And there was this guy on Twitter that thought that that – you would have thought – Andy was taking selfies with a clan hood and was like throwing around racial slurs. Like it just, it, this guy was burning Anthony, uh, burning Andy to the mm. ground. So Anthony, you're in this position where you're now the only guy I've never read a bad thing about. I'm just, I was just surprised that that's the thing you even face. I mean, I face it daily, but I, you know, we're dealing from different places. Oh, I mean, you know, like, what are people saying to you? I mean, everybody it, loves you. <laughs> Well, a good example is like everybody tries to take shots at me, you know, saying, oh, you don't have autism because you don't have those characteristics. Okay. And, and I'm always like, OK, well, first of all, what does autism look like to you and what characteristics are you talking about? And that's the number one criticism, Justin, I face with, you know, not just some people, but a lot of people, because there are some folks out there that look at autism in one way. But what we forget is that the spectrum is massive. There's a high end and there's a low end and they're all different on the spectrum. But there's an old saying, once you've met a person with autism, you've met a person with autism. And yes, I may be high functioning, but I guarantee you I have at least one, two or three common traits with everybody else on that spectrum. And that's why I've always told folks like, hey, if you don't believe me, sit down, have coffee with me, have dinner, breakfast, lunch, whatever you want. And we'll have a conversation for two hours. And I guarantee you will walk away from that conversation having a better understanding of who I am on the autism spectrum. And again, that's another reason why I wrote this book, to educate people. Because we're at a point now where, you know, we have a lot of, we have a, quite a bit of awareness in the autism community. But now we're trying to gain acceptance, which is what I'm trying to do as an advocate right now. I mean, having read your book almost in its entirety, if you're making up the whole thing, I... It's, you're the best fiction writer in the history. A J.K. Rowling needs to retire, put down the pen, the typewriter. Like, it, 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 this is the most elaborate hoax. Like, in the, going to clinics and stuff. People are such jackasses, man. I, I, I sort of alluded to it earlier. I, obviously, I mentioned my friends in that, but it's hit really close to home for me historically in my life, especially the last 15, 16 years. My nephew, who's also my godson, mm-hmm. who I'm very close with, uh, Honestly, maybe the nicest person I know, him and his brother. Like, my, my brother's two sons are like the two greatest guys you'll ever meet. They're mm. it's, you know, 15 and, or 16 and 19 now, I think. Okay. Sorry if I mess it up. But my godson, the younger of the two, was diagnosed at around age three as being on the spectrum. And I don't know how familiar you are with all of the different modalities and treatments. I know there's a yes, lot out there very, having researched it. Very. His was, I had the right to make sure I got it right. It was ABA, so Applied Behavior Analysis yep. Therapy. Mm-hmm. So he was getting this very early. Again, diagnosed at three. I mean, I remember when it happened. We were all, you know, it's autism. It's not like we didn't know what it was, but right. our understanding wasn't what it is. Fast forward 15 years later. So we were not panicked, but it was like, oh, shit, what do we do? How do we help mm-hmm. him? So he goes through all of this uh, therapy and intensive and all the effort that it put in and a lot of time on his parents' side. And it was a tough period right at the beginning, but he did really well. Yeah. And he's progressed so much now that he's ended up, this was my brother's term. If it's not clinical, I apologize. But he said he's essentially lost the label, that he is completely mainstreamed with zero assistance or accommodations mm-hmm. at school. There's no therapy. There's, you wouldn't even know. I mean, you mentioned the term high functioning, which right. is a common term. Right. Like, there's no way you would know. It's yeah. undetectable, but you would have noticed as a kid. So right. there, there, there was a big leap as sort of a, a product, byproduct of this therapy. I don't think it was an accident. So like, you know, at age 16 now, modern therapies have changed his life. Yeah. I mean, for the better significantly. We've come a long way. Let's say you have a best friend of yours. Mm-hmm. You know, we're all kind of in that age, the mid-30s now, everyone's having kids, and their son is four or five years old and is showing some of the signs yeah. and, and gets the clinical diagnosis in some form. There's different, but some form of being on the spectrum. What do you tell that friend of yours? What, what piece of advice do you give to help him help his son get through it, uh, cope, 
maybe I don't like the word cult, but just mm-hmm. sort of thrive in that situation. So the the two pieces of advice I've always have given of parents or educators is number one, never lower your expectations with your kids, you know, or your students, because the one thing, Justin, that I was super blessed with my parents was the expectations always stayed up here. Even the day they were told me, you know, your son's barely going to graduate from high school and never go to college and never be an athlete because he has autism. I'm going to tell you what my father did. He got up in that meeting, looked at those three doctors in the eyes and said, look, like, I appreciate what you're trying to do for us. I appreciate, you know, what you do as professionals. But let me tell you what our expectations are of our son. He's going to graduate from high school and then he's going to go to college. He's going to graduate. If he's an athlete in the process, great, cool. You know, that's, that's a blessing from the good Lord for our son to get those gifts. But he doesn't have to be an athlete to do all this other stuff. So in that meeting, the expectations stayed here. So I've always told parents and educators to keep the expectations high no matter what. And so, but I've also told those same parents, keeping their expectations high is making sure that you do it together as far as helping your kid get through and help them get through the resources and accommodations they needed. Now, in the mid-90s for me, there were no resources or accommodations like there are today. There was absolutely nothing. So in my diagnosis in 93, that was more of the ADD, ADHD air for diagnosis. So nobody, I mean, autism people knew about, but they didn't know what it really was like because it was still kind of new back then. So when my parents get that quote-unquote prediction from the doctors, after they say what they say, my mom and dad are like, okay, well, what now? And Thank God for the late Dr. Sandy McDonald, who was the assistant for special education at Oklahoma's High School, or Oklahoma's Public School, sorry. She was in that meeting. She was the last one to leave, and she got to my parents and said, we're going to do this together. We're going to figure out a way. And from that point on, my parents got everybody together. And they didn't do it just as Greg and Jamie Ianni. They did it with a team of people. So I've always told parents, find a team of people that you can surround yourself with and that you can not only surround yourself with, but trust too. Because I think that's the one thing my parents had with Oklahoma's public schools and the administration was they trusted them because they were putting their careers and their advice into basically to my education status, if you will. So I've always told parents, find a group of educators and administrators that you can work together in helping your child make sure they get the right services, resources, and accommodations they need to be successful. I got to tell you, it's an important thing you know, what you're doing. It's an important cause because it, it is hard, but mm-hmm. it doesn't have to be as hard as it was during your experience. Right. You mentioned there was nothing. Now there's a lot of resources. Right. I just, man to man, I got to tell you, man, like you're an awesome uh, flag bearer, uh, torch bearer, whatever you want to call it for this cause. You're a great guy. Thank you. You're a smart guy, but I can't imagine a better advocate for this space that a dude that was told no, was told not just that you won't go to college, you won't even get through high school. Mm-hmm. And not only did you achieve that, you played for Tom Izzo for a couple years. I, I, there's a lot of people not on the spectrum who were never told anything, you can't do this, you can't do that. And they're dropping like flies. I won't name names, but guys have gone running for the hills from that guy <laughs> in that program. And you met those demands. I, yep. I got to say, like I think the cause is lucky to have you. I think people in that situation are lucky to have you. If you know one of my three kids ended up in that basket with a similar diagnosis, like mm-hmm. you'd be my first call. I don't know if you take the call, oh, I but would. you'd be my first I would. call. Because I, I tell people all the time, Justin, like if especially those in the autism community, like you need anything, shoot me a call or like shoot me an email. Like I will respond to you because that's the one thing, Justin. Like, and I think this is why I earned a lot of respect from people in Michigan State when I was there. I always talk to people. Like I talked to the is zone before every game. I would I would go to the scores table, stretch out my hamstrings and you know my quads, and just have conversations with random students in the student section. And I think that's why I earned a lot of people's respect was because I went out of my way during pregame warmups to do that. And but that's who I am as a people person. And like I want to help people, especially those in my community. So that's why I've always told parents and educators, hey, if you have questions, call me. Or if a student has a question for me, like shoot me an email. Like I don't care. Like I'm going to answer you. So like, I don't know where this book is going to lead me in my career. I really don't. You know, I don't know what the future holds, which is great. But at the same time, I'm not going to stop. I'm not going to change who I am. Like 20 years from now, if somebody still needs that advice, all right, I'm going to pick up the phone. Like I'm going to be there for you. If you need me to direct you to, you know, 
the right resources for ABA therapies, guess what? I know people who work in the field. I'm going to direct you to that way. So, you know, like I had twin nieces who are on the autism spectrum, both of them. They were diagnosed at a year and a half. And so my sister called me and told me, and, you know, my heart kind of sank for a second because those are my nieces, right? But then five minutes later, like I quit sulking. I'm like, okay. I said, sis, here's who you need to call. Call this person, call that person, email this person. And not even like a couple months go by, they're in ABA therapy and they are just excelling right now. They're both going to start preschool this year. Awesome. So, and so they both went from nonverbal shy kids to one of them just wants to talk nonstop. And again, like you wouldn't think she has autism because she's just running around and like nonstop talking. And then the other one's still a little shy, but she's starting to talk a little bit here and there. She's starting to communicate with my sister and my brother-in-law. So I've seen up close what those, ther- what those ABA therapies can do. I've seen up close what those resources can do. That's why I've always told people, like, I will direct, I will guide you. I will get you to where you need to go. And then you just got to do the rest on your end. All right. Your story's awesome, man. I highly recommend everyone check out your book. But there's no way I was going to let you go without some serious Michigan State talk. Is let's that, is that let's okay? do it, man. Can I transition? Let's do okay, it. Okay. <laughs> so, like, the, the book is, is why we're here. But there's no way I'm having Anthony across from me. And not talking to the Michigan State. Let's do so it, we're going to do the Michigan State. I'm going to transition. So, and there'll be some overlap, of course, yeah, obviously, because those elements are in your story and in your book. Mm-hmm. So it's all part of your life story. So we're definitely skipping a few chapters from the book here. So Which I'm, is fine. I'm skipping that. <laughs> I'm, skipping, I'm skipping that. But bring me to your first game at Michigan State. You start at uh, Grand Valley yep. for two years, and you transfer, you come into Michigan State. Mm-hmm. You're this kid that's been told no, not even going to go through high school, not going to certainly not going to go to college, let alone a really good college like Michigan State. You're you're checking the box. Mm-hmm. You finally get there. You're putting on the uniform for the first time. What's going through your head? Oh man, honestly, man, like I, I was at a loss for words because I I dreamed my entire life of you know putting on that jersey and like running out of that tunnel. To our fight song because you know i saw my sister you know she played volleyball at michigan state and i got to see her do it and i was like man like that's like i've wanted this since i was a kid i mean i told coach Izzo at eight years old i was gonna play for him like after after one of his um post uh post game shows in, in his locker room i told him at eight years old i was gonna play for him and so for me like 12 years later after i told him that for me to be suiting up in a michigan state jersey for the university and the school that i've loved since i was a kid like it was a, truly a dream come true, but the job wasn't done yet. There were still other things I wanted to accomplish. You know, I wanted to be on full ride scholarship, you know, whether it was that year or the next year or whatever. But you remember the scene in Rudy where they're in the locker room and then the equipment manager gives him his jersey and, and Rudy just holds it up and just stares at it. Oh, yeah. That, I've seen it a million times. There's no right. scene. That, there's no scene. Oh, I can't recall. Yeah, yeah. That. That's what I seriously did in the locker room. Like our, every jersey was being hung in the locker room. And I got to my locker and I took it off the hanger and I just sat in my chair like this and I just held it up in front of me because that moment was, it was real. Like, you know, the previous year, I, all I can wear was a, you know, this black velvet or whatever it was jumpsuit. And people thought I was the assistant trainer at the time, you know, cause I didn't have the ball look. I had like patches of hair all over and everybody thought I had people thinking I was Isaiah Dolman's father for a little bit, which was you know, I was like, okay, I'm not Isaiah's dad, but whatever. Um, but just holding up that jersey and then putting it on and then running out of that tunnel to our fight zone. You know, Justin, I tell people all the time, and this is no disrespect to any player that's come before or after me in Michigan State, but there was nobody else that came within our program before or after me that took more pride in wearing that jersey than I did because it was my dream from day one. And I wanted to be a Spartan from day one. And I didn't care if I played 20 minutes, zero minutes. Like I didn't care. Like I cared about a few things in Michigan state. I cared about winning number one, because obviously we all care about winning when it comes to Michigan state. Right. Number two, I want to make my teammates better. I wanted to go into practice every day and kick Draymond Green's butt, kick Derek Nix's butt, Adrian Payne, Alex Ghana, whoever, Raymar Morgan. And three, I want to graduate from Michigan state. That's all I worried about. And if I got to play in meaningful games, that's the bonus I get for working my tail off in practice. But there was nothing better than coming out of that tunnel, you know, with that fight song playing in the background. Now, you're a really nice guy, and we've hit that. But I, I want you to be honest, because this is an honest show, and we level with the audience here, Anthony. So I, you came here to be honest. So I'm going to ask you an honest question. Go for it. I know you're nice. 
I, I know you're, you're killing with kindness. That's you. That's that's how that's how you really are. That's your presentation. At least a little bit of when you came out of that tunnel had to have been f you to the people that said you couldn't do it. Just a little bit. <laughs> I'm not saying that was the primary uh, on the pie chart mm-hmm. of your emotions. That had to have been at least like the the five percent red sliver, right? A little bit. You know, th- bit. there was part of me that said, you know what? What would those doctors and specialists think about me now? Because when I was in high school, after we had lost the um, in the Class A state championship game when we played Arthur Hill, um, you know, my my parents had like a bunch of voicemails and emails from a lot of people, and one of those doctors um, who did an evaluation on me, who made that future prediction on me, actually emailed my mom the day after the game. And saying how proud she was of me and how far I've come. And then I told my mom, or my mom said to me, you know, read this email. This is from one of the doctors that said this about you. And I read the email. My mom said, you know, what do you think about that? Like, can you let it go now? I'm like, like, mom, here's the deal. Like, you know, I'm not going to let it go because I just, it's just, it's going to take, like, this will take me farther in life if I keep it, you know, on my shoulder, that chip on my shoulder. She goes, well, can you at least forgive these folks that said this? I said, you know what, mom? I forgive them because they were just doing their job, but that doesn't mean I have to forgive them for what came out of their mouth that day. And it was the same, same mentality I had when I, when I was running out of town on Michigan state, the mentality of was, you know what? I forgive you because you're doing your job, but I don't forgive you because of what you actually tr- said about me to my family at that time. But there was always that part of me that anytime I ran out of that tunnel, anytime we won a big 10 championship, anytime I got the cut down piece of the net, when we went to the final four, I was like, yeah, Wonder what they have to say about me, Mal. No. So that was that was always in the back of my mind. I'm glad it was there because I was going to call a little BS if you did not. <laughs> it, it, it's to me, I mean, you know, believe me, I, neither one of us have been compared to Michael Jordan many times in our lives, I'm sure. But Michael Jordan is still mad at his high school coach. Oh yeah, I know. For, for cutting, I know. Him. I, Aaron Rodgers is still mad at every team that passed on him when he mm-hmm. got drafted 15 years ago. Like I, I think, and it goes way beyond athletes. I mean, it, believe me, I'm the farthest thing from an athlete. I had people when we first started this show, the audio version. I had like 60 of us. Mm-hmm. Like his first episode, I was lucky to have that many. Right. I had people ripping me, not talking about the content, mm-hmm. not talking about even me. It was just, oh, no one's listening to this shit. 60 people. I still think about that now, and we're on the come now. We're over 10,000 if you add up the platforms, and right. some way beyond that. But I could get to 10 million. Yeah, and I'm still gonna remember those people saying, "Oh, this, this fuck has 50 yeah. listeners." Like, you, you, why are you even bothering? Right. So I think that's healthy, and you've used it, you've leveraged that sort of yeah. fu yeah. mentality. I think it's a good thing, and, and there's nothing wrong with it too, because at the same time, like you know, you use that mentality and you carry and you carry it on with you for the rest of your life. Now, will I need it when I'm like retired from what I do one day, 30 years from now? No, I probably won't, because I'll probably be out in the golf course, you know. Hitting yeah. houses and trees and uh, stuff. Michael Jordan. <laughs> Michael Jordan's on the golf course. He's thirty years old. There you, you go. <laughs> and, and, and he's still he's still got it with the the edge, man. I, I don't. Oh, yeah. I think it's. I think it's drilled in you. You know you better than yeah, I know you. Yeah. But I. And, I don't it, think it you're always, ever it, that. it always will be. And you know what? I'm okay with that. But I know there's a time and place to use that mentality. There's a time and place to use it. So you know, every time like I go out and speak, like. Obviously, the mentality is go in there and be the best motivational speaker that these kids or these professionals and educators will ever hear in their lifetime. You know, I realize I'm not going to inspire everybody. I'm not going to please everybody. Like, I learned that about a year after I started. I, I learned it the hard way, obviously. But, you know, I always still have that mindset of go show those doctors and professionals why you are who you are today. You know, I don't know if, I don't know if some of them are, you know, still alive or not. Um, but at the same time, you know, I was, I'm always going to have that, hey, go show this person why you can do this. You know, go show this person who you are today, despite what their predictions were. I'll tell you what, as you know more than anybody, trying to please everybody's a fool's errand. I always laugh when a, usually it's an athlete, will donate like $30,000 to the Hurricane mm-hmm. Relief Fund for Katrina or whatever it is. And there's always 10 people. This guy made $8 million. Why is he only giving $30,000? Yeah, it's like you, you can get, this guy's <laughs> I gave thirty thousand dollars to a charity, and it's like we're chirping him over this. I mean, maybe he could have given more, but like this is your criticism of the guy. Like, right. what's the number where he's a decent guy? Like a million? Like, at what point are you not an ass to the guy? Right. So, pe- I mean, people just can kind of suck. I mean, I, I think most people are decent, but Twitter has more than their fair share of of 
shitty people. I mean, the fact that you are getting heat is just, I, I haven't seen that, but I'll take your word for it. And I got to tell you, again, I'll repeat it for the third time. People need to get your book, man, because it's 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 really it was eye opening. Even as someone that was familiar with your story, so let's get back on the MSU track a little bit, mm-hmm. and and you know the certain threads will carry through. This will be a pet question for me because I'm dying to know about it. <laughs> the Carrier Classic. So yes. those that know me know, uh, obviously a Spartan, but also a Tar Heel. I'm completing my MBA through UNC right now, so go Tar Heel Blue when you're not playing Michigan State. <laughs> but so this game is in November 2011. Yeah. This is why I will not let anybody question the reign of Mark Hollis in terms of his performance in the athletic department. I don't think I'm not going to get into the scandals up there. I don't think there's any evidence he did anything wrong from my understanding, but in terms of what he did as an mm. AD, like to me he's beyond reproach. This kind of stuff, this carrier classic, which is like one of the three coolest things I've ever seen in sports, like you're on this aircraft carrier and the president's walking across this court that's like where they usually land helicopters. I was just it's fucking wild, man. So <laughs> November 2011, you're there. Mm-hmm. I mean you're you're on this ship. I just I, I don't even have like one particular question. Just what was that like? Like what I mean, did you ride on like a, a ferry? Like how did you like how <laughs> did you fly? Just like kind of take me through what that whole experience was like. So we actually uh flew into San Diego Airport and then we took and we stayed on Coronado uh Coronado Island. Oh beautiful. So where the where the military base is at. And so they took us right off the plane right to the USS Carl Vinson. And we got an entire tour of the ship, which was just awesome. So we got to meet the men and women of our armed forces on that boat, what they do on a daily basis. We, they try to put us in like their little beds that they sleep in. And I remember Adrian Payne, you know, six, all six foot 11 of him, try to fit in the middle bunk. And Draymond was on the top bunk and like Travis Trice, the little guy he was. You guys stayed on? I didn't no, stay- no. So oh. we, we didn't stay on the ship, but okay. like, um, so we stayed at a hotel, like maybe like 10 minutes from there on, on the island. Gotcha. And so, but we were just like, you know, we were just amazed by this because it, like honestly, Justin, like it was better than winning a Big Ten championship, honestly, because it's an experience that we will never get to have ever again. And obviously, Ohio State Marquette tried to do it the following year, but obviously it failed because they tried to do it in Annapolis. We did it in San Diego, where it was beautiful weather and warm. Um, but just the fact that we got to meet the men and women of our armed forces, actually get to go on an aircraft carry, and it wasn't just like this tiny little boat either. This thing was huge. Like this boat was massive, and they were telling us how. You know, the jets will land and then another one will take off at the same time. And they only have like a certain amount of seconds to land and then take off. And we were just amazed by this. And so, but the best part was, was meeting President Obama. And that was, um, so, so my family, my dad, my mom, my sister got to meet Bill Clinton when he came to Michigan State in the mid 90s and did his commencement uh, speech there. So I didn't get to go because of who I, you know, because of that young age, you know, my parents were a little worried that, you know, I would say something embarrassing in front of the president or something I understood. But I got to meet the 44th president of the United States, Barack Obama. And I'll never forget when they had us in this tent behind the court before the game and Secret Service walks in and you talk about strict. These guys, man, were super strict. So this guy walks in with his sunglasses on like big dude takes him off and goes, all right, gentlemen, here's the deal. The president's on his way. He'll be here momentarily, but here are the rules. You're going to extend your hand out like this, and you will say, hi, Mr. President. My name is so-and-so. You will only call him Mr. President. You will not refer to him as Barack. You will not refer to him as Obama. You will not refer to him as homie. You will not refer to him as Mr. Obama. And Keith Appling and Data and Draymond Green stand next to me. We all look at each other going, whoa, like, okay. He goes, now the first lady will be, her, be with here, uh, here with him too. Same thing. Extend your hand. Hi, first lady. My name is so-and-so. You will not call her Michelle. You will not call her Mrs. Obama. You will not call her Bay. You will call her first lady. And we're all, again, looking around going, like, come on, man. Like, we're not going to call the first lady Bay. Like, come on now. <laughs> did, did you really say that? You no, I swear to God. Bay? Swear to God. I was oh like, my God. I was like, man, we're getting, like, the strict, like, rule. Well, I understand, the like, if they're telling you no sudden <laughs> movements or don't hug them. Like, that I can respect. So they, but why do they have to tell you how to greet them? That's odd to me. Because I think I think it was because, well, obviously, a majority of us had never met a president before. You know, it was the first time but for it's everything. It's not a security issue. It's an etiquette no, issue. No, it's, you're right. It's an etiquette issue. 
issue. So they were teaching us how to like properly introduce yourself. Okay, to so the it wasn't like if you if you call her Bay, like we're taking you They're down. They're gonna with escort the you out of the tent. No, you're, they, you're, you're it, not it, playing it this game. It definitely was proper etiquette. Um, okay, proper that's etiquette a little rules. better that way. So so Barack, so President Obama walks in the tent and he starts shaking hands with North Carolina first, and he's just going down this line. And I'll never forget some of our freshmen. It looked like it was Christmas Day when they were like little kids. The excitement, like it got to the point where everybody was so excited, like our line got pushed up further and further. And I'm like squishing the Draymond and, and Adrian Payne out. And, and Day Day was like, everybody just move back, like just scoop back. Like everything's going to be fine, man. Like, he's, he's, he's coming down the line. He'll yeah, get, like he'll just get be there. patient. It's, yeah. it's, like, it's like waiting for Santa Claus at the mall, man. Okay. <laughs> yeah. You, you, your turn's going to happen. Your turn's going to happen. The greatest pop culture president since the guy over your shoulder, JFK. I mean, he was yeah. a celebrity president. He was. And so when he got to me, you know, I shook his hand. I said, "Hi, Mr. President. I'm, I'm Anthony Ianni. It's nice to meet you." He said, "Hey, Anthony. Oh, hey. I heard you're graduating this year. Congratulations!" And I was like, "Thank you." And I, I was like, "Wait, what? Like, how did you like? Did you look at a roster like say where it says I'm a senior? Like, what? Like, how did you?" But anyway, so and meeting like the first lady was just awesome. And so obviously we lost the game, obviously, but the experience that we had. It didn't matter who won or lost that game because the last 10, 10, 20 seconds of the game, all you heard was USA chant. Like I had chills like just listening to that. And then we gave our jerseys to uh, the wounded pool, which was awesome. You know, that was Draymond's idea. You know, he got both teams together and said, hey, you know, let's give our jerseys to the wounded. You know, we'll find a way to get our own jerseys down the road. But these are the men and women that deserve these jerseys the most. So I signed the jersey, gave it to somebody at courtside, which is awesome. Now, the best part of the Obama story is this. So, so when he landed, like we didn't know when he landed. Um, so, but we had no idea what was going on at the time when he landed outside. So the airport is right across the bay. So Air Force One landed, he got in a little boat and he was escorted by Harbor Police Patrol, everybody. So he, he has his little, obviously he has the entrance music, Hail to the Chief. And now he has his exit music where he's about to walk out. And so the PA announcer goes, ladies and gentlemen, the president has now left. Will you please remain where you are at? And I was like, I was like, man, like, why? So I'm, I'm standing next to the soldier. I said, um, sir, you might ask you a question. He goes, yeah, what's up? I said, how come we can't move? Like the president's already half, he's out in the harbor right now going to the airport. Like, so if I were to move right now, he's not even here. If I move like two or five steps to my left, what would happen? He goes, come here, I'll show you. And he points to the tower, points to the tower at the uh, top of the ship. He goes, See that little shadowy figure up there that's kind of moving back and forth, looking over everybody? So yeah, that guy's got a nice rifle in his hand. So if anybody tries to take 10 steps to their right or their left, it's not going to be a good day for oh him. I was like, the guy's in the harbor. <laughs> I was like, like okay you know, then. Launcher on Whoa. Your shoulder? Like under your, your warm up? <laughs> so I was like, okay then. I got a real good education today on the president today. So, I mean, we, it, we just had so much fun, man. And like, we learned so much, you know, about our men and women of our armed forces. Obviously we learned about, you know, the presidency and everything like that. Um, but it was just so cool, man. And, you know, I, I love Mark Hollis. That's my guy and always will be. And the idea is like, like when he first came up with that idea, you know, we were all like, okay, how are you going to do this? Like, where are you going to put people, a crowd of people on a boat? Like, how are you going to do this? And then when he showed us the designs as we were going to the NCAA tournament against UCLA, my retro junior year, he showed the designs on the plane and we were like, okay, well, that's a drawing. Like, how are you going to actually do this? And when we got on the, when we got on the boat after we landed and we saw the court, we were like, all right the boss wasn't lying. He said this was going to get done and it got done. And what was really cool, Justin was like below deck, like they had an indoor court just in case. So really? they had an indoor court all set up just in case. That's how big the, the lower deck of the ship is. They had the bleachers ready to go just in case they had, the, they were going to move the court down there and they needed to, they had enough space on that, on that ship to put an indoor court in there. Where was your locker room? Did you get ready like so, in the so, kitchen hallway? No. <laughs> No, so we um they actually had like little trailers for us in the back. Um so that I mean so we got dressed at the hotel and then we just um got dressed at the hotel after the game. But our locker room was like it was like a little trailer behind the court. So what is what is Tom Izzo say to you before that game? I can't imagine it's like a typical hey, you know, yeah. keep an eye on number 4. Like th th he had to have been like, "Hey guys, take it in or something," right? What yeah. Was like like obviously it was obviously the Xs and Os, you know, treatment of as course. well. But at the same time, like he also said, you know, I want you to 
you know, try to take as, as much of this in as possible because this is something that may never happen in the history of college basketball. This is something that may never happen in the history of our country ever again. So, but just remember what tonight is really all about. Not remember, this is, there isn't just a basketball game going on. There's folks out there who protect our country, folks that you will never meet in your lifetime ever again when you leave this place. You, I want you to soak it all in as much as possible, but also at the same time, remember you're here on a business trip. You know, it's, it's not, it's, it's like all fun and games at times, but there's also a time and place to remember where you're also here on business. So he made sure to remind us that soak it all in, enjoy it, but at the same time, you are also here on business. Ben, can you, before we move on, throw that, uh, those images, that little slideshow of the, cause I want to look, I, I, I know you've played it. I saw it in my peripheral. I just want to like, this is, oh, man. this is one of the coolest things ever. But, and you, you said the game worn jerseys went to, was it wounded heroes? Went to the wounded. Yep. Okay. Wounded heroes. I am neither wounded nor a hero, but I do have Russell Bird shorts from that game. Actually. They, so that's, <laughs> I, I have Russell Bird shorts upstairs in my, in my drawer. We, we kept, we kept the shorts, obviously. We yeah. Kept those. Yeah. The shorts, <laughs> the, the shorts were on eBay. I don't think Russell Bird loved his Michigan state experience because everything was for sale. Like, right after, but uh, it's just that the images are, are so cool. And, you know, it was one of those things where I, I was searching just for due diligence if there was any way to, like, scalp a ticket to that thing. It's like, no. Oh, like, there's it, not it, it was the most expensive, you know, ticket ever, probably. It wasn't even available. No, it, was, it, it was wasn't. military, and I think your family Military go, families right? and yeah. certain celebrities. So yeah. Pam Anderson and Brooklyn Decker were sitting front row behind our bench. Oh, they're, they're I was American like, heroes. Yeah, they yeah. Are. I was like, well, but it's funny because Austin Thornton and I joke all the time, you know, about who would get, like, the most popular you know, celebrity high. So like when we were walking off the ship, our first day, North Carolina was walking on and Vince Carter was with them. And, you know, he walks by us. I'm with Austin. Austin goes, Hey Vince, how you doing? <laughs> and Vince just goes, Hey, what's up? How you doing? He goes, try to beat that AI. I'm like, I'm like, how am I supposed to beat that? So after the game, we get on the bus and all of a sudden Mike Vorkovich, our strength and conditioning coach at the time, he just started laughing. This is after a loss. And we're all like, what what is Vork laughing about? And then all of a sudden he turns his head and goes, "Hey, wh- where's AI at?" I'm like, "I'm I'm right here. What's up?" He goes, "Do you have Twitter?" I'm like, "No, I don't." And he goes, "You need to read this." So he said, "Read the tweet out loud." And I go, "All right." Michigan State's got a 40 year old man on their team, <laughs> and everybody just started dying. I was laughing too. And then all of a sudden, you know, Austin goes, "Hey, a- AI, who tweeted it?" I go. Uh, at KD Trey five. Oh, it was, Ke- it was Kevin Durant. <laughs> Wait, Durant, what? Durant. Kevin, De- Kevin Durant called me a 40 year old man on Twitter. Like this is sweet. Well, and- I mean, he was drafted right after a 40 year old man. This so he, he, he has animosity <laughs> for people that look a little older than their age. So I think that there's some uh, h- history there. He's dealing with, he's trying to, so, so I told Austin, I said, I think I just beat you. He goes, Vince Carter said hi to me. I said, I don't care. Kevin Durant called me a 40-year-old man on Twitter, man. That beats oh, anything. Oh, you smoke him. <laughs> like, you, you had an unsolicited like call-out from a guy who, frankly, is a much better player than Vince Carter, too. But like yours is way better. Sorry, Austin. Like, <laughs> I appreciate what you did in the Big Ten tournament in Indy a few years ago. But like, no. Nah, well, J- J- Draymond, Draymond was a little jealous. He goes, where's my shout-out from KD? I said, dude, you're probably going to play in the NBA with him. Just relax. Yeah, and then yeah. five years later, he was playing with Kevin Durant. It, wor- it, wor- it worked <laughs> out. And then they famously had a falling out and did a podcast that oh, people have been talking man. about for the past that, 30 that, days. That, that was crazy. So <laughs> I- I'll move on. I will say lastly, though, you know, the Mark Hollis artist rendering of that event actually coming to fruition are heartwarming because I was a guy that watched all the artist renderings of the district Detroit that were beautiful and they did not come to fruition. So Mark Hollis is a man that delivers. We have a new AD at Michigan mm-hmm. State right now. I actually tweeted, I can't remember if it was today or yesterday. These days I'll blend together. I sleep like two hours a night, man. <laughs> a, a vampire on both ends. But like I think Hollis was a trailblazer that came up with Weird in the best way, cool stuff. Yep. Even though he wasn't at the top spot, he is generally credited as the mastermind for uh, the, the Cold War, the outdoor hockey oh, yeah. game. Oh, yeah. I, I mean, he was the guy really pushing that. He really massaged the relationship with Nike, is largely credited for all the weird, cool uniforms that the kids yep. love, like the pro combats. <laughs> so, like, that was him. Bill Beekman came in when the department was under duress and mm. public pressure, and he was sort of a vanilla, smooth things over. He's non-controversial, like, just like you. No one's ever said a bad word about him. Like Everybody loves him, never going to get in trouble. Just kind of like 
stabilize everything. Right. You don't want to be out there making waves like Mark Hollis did, standing out in a, in a – you don't want to be ostentatious when you already have a light on you. Right. I think Beekman was perfect for that two and a half, three years. Just kind of lay low. Right. Just, yeah. just check the boxes, keep things calm. Now I think we're past the point of stabilization. We're and Mel Tucker's here, obviously, yep. is changing everything. So it'll be interesting to see where we go as a department. I, yeah. you know, I obviously uh, Howard's been here for a long time, but I, I don't know what he's going to be like in the top role. But he's already saying some good stuff. I'm yeah. excited. And and, and I, I love Alan too. Like I've known him for 11 years now. I think he's going to do an incredible job. I Everybody really loves him. Like everything I've heard about him, he's just a, he's just a nice all around guy. He really is. And I'm I'm excited for our fans to get a chance to meet him and see what he does. But I, when he got the job, I was like, "Yep, you know what? We're we're gonna be in good hands." I'm sure you know Jack Abwin, right? Yeah, I know Jack. Yeah, yeah, Captain Jack. I call him the Mayor of East Lansing. He's, he's <laughs> he knows everybody. He, he, he knows everybody. He, he, I can't. You know, I, I'm sorry because it's a viewer of this show, and I can't remember even who it was. But somebody saw the pictures of Jack. Here at the house for the Jalen Watts Jackson painting unveiling, mm-hmm. and was telling me a story about oh, like that, that's a great guy to get that Jack Ebling. He goes, anybody that wants to get an interview with Izzo, any media member, anybody, mm-hmm. even if it's Rich Eyes, they have to go through um, Max. They yep. have to go through yep. Max. Like you go through Max. Like it's it, it does. I don't care if you're Jim Rome. I don't care if you're yep. Colin it Cowherd. Does not matter. Like you go through Max Carey. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, like F you, you're gonna have to deal with an angry Max and Izzo's not gonna return your call. Right. Jack Ebling's the one exception. Like yep. Jack's got <laughs> Jack's got Tom Izzo's cell. And Jack like and Max knows and I think Max I brought this up to Max. Max I think Max confirmed this when I talked to him. I he didn't deny it for sure. But you know, it's just like, yeah, like Jack Ebling, man. It's, uh, it's Jack. the mayor. But the reason I he, the reason I bring up the mayor is he and I agree that Darian Harris is eventually going to be the athletic director. Now, I'm not saying... Oh, I'm on that train. I'm not saying I'm in four on years. <laughs> I think Allen is going to have... Like, like 20 years from now. 20, 20 years, years from now, yes. A great 20 yes. years. He's going to leave of his own volition. He's going to move into some other role. He's going to say, I'm ready for the next challenge. Yep. So I'm not indicting Allen. <laughs> but Darian Harris, man, I'm yes. telling you, that guy. if that guy's not like a future college administrator nobody is a future college no. administrator if he wants it i mean he can he's one of those guys like if he wants to be in construction he's going to be the best fucking construction manager <laughs> right. in the state if this guy wants to be in landscaping he's going to be the best landscaper. he's going to be the man that guy's just he's smart he, he's he's just he's he just gets it. Yeah. I, certain people just I mean you seem to know him too. Mm-hmm, he's been in studio a couple times like that guy I hope he's the AD when Allen builds us an Emerald Palace mm-hmm. in 20 years and he wants to be on a beach in Tahiti. After that, I think Darian's going to be I, the guy. I, I've joked with Darian before. I said, hey, like, I'm, I'm going to vouch for you to be AD one day. And if you get AD, man, I expect you to put me in that department as like an assistant athletic director for yeah. like in- inclusion or like century rooms or oh, anything like no, that. No, I said, no, inclusion. That's too, I, that's like seventh on the org chart. I want you in the number, <laughs> I want you number two, like your dad, that would be coming full circle. I don't know. That'd be, that'd be cool. But man, Darian, I'm telling you that guy, whatever he does, I just, I hope he never he, leaves the family. He's got, he's got a bright future, man. And I'll, I'll He's not going anywhere anytime soon. I, I hope doubt not. It. He's a Spartan dog, man. He really bleeds it. I mean, he does. More than even the average Spartan. He that really guy does. bleeds it. He's on my wall. He's on, he's on there on our on our studio wall. Great okay. guy. So you mentioned Draymond Green. Uh, obviously, I mean, far and away the most well-known guy you've mm-hmm. played with, right? Yeah. I mean, is that fair? Yeah, like, I definitely say that's fair. It, it just – most people think a Hall of Famer. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Ant Wright, Michigan oh, basketball yeah. player. Oh, yeah, yeah, I follow him, yeah. Yeah, he's been in studio. He's a, he's a big – he thinks Draymond Green is, like, top ten player in the league. Not, maybe not now, but five years ago. <laughs> yeah, five years he ago. He has so much respect for Draymond. So I got to tell you, though, Draymond, this is entirely second, third, and fourth hand. And I, I'm just getting that out now. Yeah. I Because this is not first hand. I've never met Draymond Green. I have no – issues with Draymond Green, but there are people that I trust, not people at a water cooler, at a bar. People I know, that have never lied to me that I know before, that view him as, at best, polarizing. Not that he's the world's worst guy or he's out there committing crimes or anything, <laughs> but just <laughs> he's kind of a jerk is what I've heard. You've played with the guy. You mm-hmm. were there with him for two years. Like, what is Draymond Green like the guy? Like, what's he like just as a dude? We see the player. What's he like as a dude? Nicest guy you'll ever meet. Really? No joke. I, no lie. I've heard mixed because I, I said polarizing. I didn't yep. say universally hated. Right. I've heard that. 
But I've heard more of yeah, he, the other. W- without question, Justin, like, he is one of the nicest dudes like you'll ever meet. And, like, you know, I think a lot of people get a different perspective on him because of what you see on the court. Off the court, though, like, he does a lot of community work. Off the court, he is a father of two or three kids. And he is a husband. So, like, the player is the guy that, you know, who wants to win and will win at all costs. This is also the same guy, though, that when he came to the league said he wanted to bring back that bad boy attitude era from the Pistons because he grew up watching those guys. We all did. And he was bring, he wanted to bring back an element to the NBA that hadn't been brought back in years. He wanted to be that bad boy of the NBA. Well, he's doing that. But the, the thing is, he's doing the little things doing it. He's getting triple doubles off of rebounds, assists, and steals, which is ridiculous. Like, he's almost had a quadruple double before. But, like, what he did at Michigan State, not just as a player, but as a leader, and this is, this is no disrespect toward guys like Mateen, guys like Cassius or Denzel or, or Smitty, but Draymond, in my opinion, is the greatest leader to ever come through our program because he held you accountable, not just on the court, but off the court. He made sure that you took, care, you took care of your stuff off the court and that when you came to practice, it was time to go to work. You bring your, you bring your lunch pail, bring your hard hat, let's get after it. And that's why, like, you know, Draymond and I, we knew each other a little bit in high school. We played AU together for about a month. And that was the last time we really saw each other. And then when I transferred to Michigan State, you know, when I had my first workout with the team, and Isaiah Dolman was trying to figure out a nickname for me. And he was coming up with, like, all these weird, like, you know, I'm just going to say, like, just weird nicknames. He was like, Ayanto. Uh, like, I'm like, what? Like, why, why are you calling me Ayanto? Like, where did you come up with that idea? And Draymond heard that and goes, Zeke, no, like, it's AI, all right? It's AI, nothing else, all right? End of conversation. And I was like, all right, cool. You know, Draymond says AI, lays down the law, we're good. And reminder, this is a fresh, this is a soon to be sophomore Draymond Green. And the fact that people are like, yep, if, if Day Day says this, then we're going to go this direction then. Like, you're listening to him as a sophomore, which I think really told who he was as a person. How, I don't want to say demanding, but like, he brought like that presence in a room. Like if he walks in and says something, you're going to be listening to him. Whereas if you don't listen to him, you're probably going to pay the price for it. But just who he was in that locker room, not just as a leader, but as a person. You know, I tell people all the time, if Draymond Green, if, if my kids ever had the opportunity to play with Draymond as a team, like play with Draymond one day, I would say, yeah, in a heartbeat. If Draymond coached my kids one day, I say, yeah, 100% in a heartbeat because I learned something new and something different from him every day. He got to learn something new and different from me every day because, you know, he found out that I was on the autism spectrum. So some people don't know this story. So going into my redshirt junior year, we had uh, workouts, we had lifting one day. And so Draymond walks in the weight room one day and says, hey, AI, Coach Jizzo said you got to do the VO2 workout today. And for those of you watching and listening, for those of you that don't know what the VO2 workout is, it's where incoming freshmen, incoming transfers have to do a you know, certain amount of certain workouts where they test your endurance, they measure your breathing, they measure your body to uh, your body fat, your weight, all this stuff, blood sugar. They hook you up like all these machines. I hated it, man. I had to do it twice. My freshman year at Grand Valley State and then the year I transferred. So but I already did it the year before though. So, but when Draymond says, all right, Coach Izzo says you got to, you know, do the VO2 again. I'm like, is he being serious? Or like, I mean, he said Coach Izzo said it. So the whole workout, he kept saying it and reminding me. And then somebody, I walked up, I think it was Austin at the time, because Austin's known me for 17 years. So he knew I was on the autism spectrum. He knew I did not understand jokes and sarcasm really well. And I was very sensitive about it. So I walked over to Austin. I said, please tell me he's kidding. He goes, yeah, he is. So after I heard about that, I walked over to Draymond and I got in his face and I wanted to knock his, knock his head clean off because I was so ticked off at what he was saying to me. And he was like, you know, if you can't take a joke, then you shouldn't be on the team. And then we started shoving each other. And then other guys started shoving. You got into a fight with Draymond? We, it, it was a shoving match. And then I other, didn't hear this story and, in the LSJ. And then, well, because behind the scenes. And Where so, was Solari on that one? I'm going to call him. Well, NBA NBA's uh, Beyond the Paint already beat them to that two <laughs> oh, years okay. ago. That story's out there. Yeah, oh yeah, it's out I there. I have not heard that one. And so, so we get into a shoving match, and the rest of the guys get into a shoving match because the guys are trying to pick sides in the matter. And then, and then Vork, uh, Mike Vorkovich steps in and goes, "Draymond, do you want to know why Anthony can't understand you? It's because he's autistic. He has autism." And Vork just kind of looked at me and went, "Oh, like, are you okay if I?" 
are you okay with this? Because I think he was like, oh, should I have AI tell him? Or like, and he's like, are you okay with this? I'm like, well, the cat's out of the bag, so you yeah, might as well just yeah. keep going now. Thanks for asking I, now, sir. Yeah, yeah. so like a- after I said, you know, go ahead, I don't care, and I just stormed off, um, he said to Draymond, I said, Draymond, look, like, Anthony has autism. Like, he can't understand your jokes. He thinks you're picking on him because everything, some things to him are very black and white. And then Derek Nix, God bless Derek Nix. I love Nix. That's my guy. He overheard the conversation. And he goes, well, I don't see what the big deal is. You know, if AI is artistic, you know, I'm artistic too. (laughs) Uh, And and Vork Vork goes, what did you just say? And Nix goes, well, artistic. That's what you said, right? And Vork goes, autism. Autistic, not art, not art, buddy, not artwork with pan, uh, crayons, paintbrushes. Well, art has to do with anything. Well, like you're out there so, painting so, in the hallway. Well, but again, though, that's how very little my teammates knew about autism at that time. Yeah. So they all got a good lesson in it. So we go back to weights on Monday because this happened on a Friday, and Draymond came up to me and said, "Hey, you know, AI, why didn't you tell me about all this?" I said, "Well, I said, Day Day, I don't know how you were going to react. Like, I thought you were going to be like other people in my life that I've known that I've told it to, and then they just." treated me completely differently after that and he just looked at me and said well i said kudos to you man because look how far you've come you know it's incredible the second of all if you would have told me this earlier the shoving match could have been avoided <laughs> so I, i'm happy it happened it's a better story you, you know what like it was a blessing in disguise justin because not only did we become better teammates after that but it changed our relationship forever and so like i earned his respect and he earned mine and by by meaning respect from him, I, his I, earning that yeah, me earning his respect and his, and him earning mine. What I mean by that is I saw who he really was that day. You know, he understood. And then they started asking me questions, my teammates, about what autism is. And even after I graduated, I still had them asking questions. Dane Fife, a year after I graduated, you know, I love Fife. I'm sad he's at IU, but he's got to deal with us beating him twice every year, yeah, I guess. He went home. <laughs> he did. And, he will be the next head basketball coach at Indiana in less than five years. I Mark. heard I heard he left MSU because he realized he was never going to get the top job. I heard that. I, the I have not heard anything about that. I, I, I know you wouldn't even admit it if you'd <laughs> had, but that's why he left. I, I, I've always thought, you know, wife would always be IU's guy because it's, you know, it's, he, it's home for him. Yeah. Exactly. And his wife is from Bloomington, too, so it's home for them. But um. He's a great guy too, but go ahead. I love Fife. Yeah, my guy. Great guy. One of my favorite coaches. I, I've had a lot of great coaches, but Fife's number one on my list. Um, but like even a year after I graduated, I'm in Fife's office and he's asking me questions. Hey, you know, I'm going to be in coaching for a long time. And if I recruit a kid with autism, you know, how can I tell what their characteristics are? Like what, what worked for you when we coached you? What didn't work? What made you click? What didn't make you click? And the fact that I have our assistant coaches asking me questions about that because they realize that Anthony Ianni is not going to be the first. There's going to be others to come in the future. No, we don't know when or where. But the fact that my teammates were asking questions, the fact that Day Day was asking questions, Life was asking questions, Coach Izzo, Coach Stevens, and, and Mike Garland, it showed me how much they cared. And if that incident does not happen in the weight room, like I really don't know what kind of relationship I have with my teammates. But at the same time, it's also a testament to Coach Izzo because of the family atmosphere he's installed, not just in Michigan, not just in our basketball program, but at our university as a whole. I want to talk a little bit, and this, this might be a little dark for you, Anthony, but I, 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 I'm dying to know. And I was, I was debating whether just asking you off air, but you were on one of the more perplexing Michigan State teams, in my opinion. Yep, 10-11. You got it. You knew exactly where I was yep. going. I was only, it was 50-50 chance, <laughs> but, but you knew where I was going. I knew. What the hell happened? So let me paint, let me paint oh, the picture. Oh, man. Because I actually had Darrell Summers on the show, not in studio. It was the old audio version. So yeah. it was via phone, but still on Apple Podcasts. I don't even remember how that interview went in its entirety. But I had Darrell on, talked to him for half an hour about it. And I still had no idea, and he was, he, was, he was a starter on the team. So for those that don't remember or those who had such terrible PTSD that they have uh, forgotten it to protect their psyche, as Freud would uh, purport, <laughs> um, this was a team that was preseason number two. So they go to the Final Four and, in my opinion, have the most impressive run to the championship game in 2009. They followed up in 2010, losing essentially by one point to Butler in the Final Four on a blown no foul call on Draymond yep. Green at the end uh, against Gordon Hayward. And that was without the big 10 player there, Kalen Lucas, who had been hurt two games prior. 
So back to back Final Fours, really. 09 probably wins the national title mm-hmm. seven out of 10 years. I mean, they ran into a North Carolina buzzsaw. Yep. And 2010, I think, definitely wins the national title if Kalen Lucas doesn't go down. For sure. But the 2011 teams are going into the next year, your first year there. Yep. You probably wouldn't, I'm, I'm sure you would have cared, but you would have cared a little less if they didn't win a single game. You were just so thrilled like to be there that first year, mm-hmm. not to speak for you, but like being. Jackass spoiled Justin Spiro at the time. I was still a student. <laughs> I was like printing the, the boarding pass for the Final Four that year, wherever yeah. the hell it was. I can't remember. I think it was Houston. Was it Houston? I'm positive. It, it was, it was like everybody's, everybody's back. Yep. Like Kalen's coming back. The expectations Rec- were through the roof. Ev- yep. Everybody was back. Preseason number two. And look, wouldn't be the first team to fall short of expectations in the history of college basketball. Right, yeah. But it was a cavernous gap from like yeah. you guys. You get, I mean, I remember talking to my brother Sean. Like we're like, they're gonna go like thirty three and two. Like they're gonna fall asleep. <laughs> you know, they'll fall asleep on the road in Columbus one night. Like everyone has that like one or two games. But like other than that, they're gonna run roughshod over the whole country. End up barely making the tournament. Yep. One and done. A lot of it, Darrell Summers not chasing after loose balls. It, it was a, a team that. Barely made the tournament and fell well short of expectations. I still don't know what happened. There were not catastrophic injuries. You had Kalen Lucas, Darrell Summers, Draymond Green. I don't even have to tell you a fourth name. Those three alone should have yielded a better season, you would think. Mm-hmm. I don't know what happened. I'm curious for your take on it. Uh, just you tell me, you were there, you were going into the season with all the hype. What do you, what's your take on it? What happened there? Well, I hated that season, first of all. I absolutely hated it. I was miserable because, you know, number one, that was a season where I actually contemplated. That was after after that season, I contemplated whether or not I wanted to come back. Really? Yes. I, ta- I actually I actually talk about that. It, it is mentioned. Yeah, is I, mentioned. I, I talked about how. Yeah, I you want, had second thoughts about yep, your returning. I, I seriously like because that year took so much out of me from a from a mental standpoint and just like because my my uncle um and th- I, I guess this is kind of where. You know, the expectations were up here. Everything was good. Everything was great. And then all of a sudden, boom, things just go downhill. So my uncle on October 17, 2010, was shot and killed in his own home. And that was my godfather at the time, too. You talk about that. Yep. Yep. And so my mentality was I don't give a damn anymore. I skipped class. I, you know, just didn't want to do anything. Basketball. So my priorities in my life, Justin, have always, especially back in the day, were always faith, because I've always said God's number one, family, school, basketball, because you're called a student athlete for a reason. Student comes for athlete, right? After my uncle had died, it became faith, family, school, basketball, because during that time, I treated my teammates and coaches just like family, and I did not want to lose anybody ever again the way I lost my uncle. So that's what really kind of like started the downfall of that year for me. And so then we get to the season and, you know, we start out okay. You know, we start out like five and two or whatever it was. You know, we lose a tight game at Duke, you know, at Cameron Indoor, which is not an easy place to play. Um, But then we're playing Oakland at the Palace and we barely beat Oakland. And then we go ahead and we play Texas a few weeks later at home and we get drilled. Yeah, it was 30 points. It was like a 20 point loss. And like like, Tristan Thompson just absolutely killed us that game and so i'm thinking okay it's one bad loss you know we're going into christmas break we'll be fine we'll just you know maybe we maybe we just need a little time away from each other and just regroup and then we come back we beat wisconsin and we get off to a solid start but then we go to penn state and then we lose because taylor battle had to go off for like 30 40 points or whatever it was that day and so and then we get back and it was completely different after that and then we play michigan and then we lose to Michigan. And Michigan wasn't that good. And Jordan Morgan, that's Jordan Morgan, who played at Michigan at the time, was one of my closest friends today. He told me that they had lost to a horrible Minnesota team prior to playing us. And their mindset was if we beat Michigan State, it's going to turn our, not just our season around, but it's going to turn our program around. That win turned Michigan's program around completely. And they go to the tournament that season. But then, Corey Lucius gets dismissed a couple of weeks later. 
And I think that really kind of just sucked the life out of the team a little bit because Corey is, was one of the nicest guys you could ever meet. Like I always, I had nothing, I have nothing bad to say about him. Corey's my guy. I love him. But obviously there were decisions made on his end that cost him his career at Michigan State. And so I was a little sad because Corey was my roommate on the road. And now I'm rooming with one of our managers and, you know, I love our managers, but at the same time, you know, Corey was a guy I could always talk to and just like get laughs from. Right. But the, the camaraderie we had just was not there. And when you don't have good team camaraderie, it's, it spells disaster. And that's what happened. We did not have as great team chemistry as we had in the past. I don't know why. And there were, and there were times where, you know, I felt like that one guy was for himself and he wasn't for the team, wasn't for the program, just looking out for himself. And you can kind of tell that, that there was so much, the room and the, lock, the locker room and every practice was tense for whatever reason. But it doesn't help either, Justin, when you go to Iowa and you play. And, I, and, I, and I've listened to Mike Valeni's rant after this game before on YouTube a bunch of times. Um, he went Oh, oh, he did. Called you quitters. Yes, he did. Said he was never going to talk about the yep. program again for yep. that season. And he said how every single one of us should turn in our uniforms. Yep. I, I remember, like, I, I remember him saying that. Um, but when you lose to a one or either a one team Big Ten win, or a, they were like one and nine, yeah, and one that, and eleven. They, they had like one one win or whatever. You were and, down like thirty five to eight or something. We, we we were down like we lost the game by like almost thirty. But it, it started like thirty five to yeah thirty five eight thirty five eleven something or like whatever. Yeah. And and I didn't make the road trip because um because I was sick and the trainers told me to stay home. So I'm watching it from home and I'm like, like what is this? And then we go to Wisconsin and we get blasted by twenty seven at Wisconsin on Super Bowl Sunday and I'm just like. Like what? Like this is not Michigan State basketball, and so then we go to the Big Ten tournament, and we almost lost to Iowa again in the first round. We had to beat them by like three or four. Then we play Purdue, and we smack them by twenty plus again in the tournament, and we lose to Penn State again. You know, Taylor Battle goes off, but then we lose to UCLA when we were down by twenty seven to UCLA. Rallied back. Yeah, we rallied back, and but then Kalen gets the ball toward the end and travels, and I'm like, you know what? That kind of sums up our season right there. That's just how our year has been. You know, we get our butts whooped. You know, we, we fought in the end, which is what, you know, valiant effort. But the way it ended kind of was like, okay, how, that, how this whole game ended was basically how our entire season was. But here's what the one thing I do remember about that season. And this was even before I even contemplated walking away. We got off the team bus in, um, in Tampa after the tournament game. And Draymond was walking with Austin, and I ran up to them. I put my arms around their shoulders. I said, hey, guys, here's the deal. I'm not going out like this next year. You're not going out like this next year. I said, I don't care what I got to do. I don't care who I need to, you know, whose butt I need to kick in practice every day. I said, but I'm going to do whatever it takes to make sure that we, us juniors, soon to be seniors, do not go out like this next year. So Draymond, we're going to send you out on a good note. Austin, we're going to send you out a good, on a good note. We're going to send me out on a good note. We're going to go out as champions next year. I said, I guarantee it. We're going to do this. And I walked away from the conversation going, you know what? It's a different team next year. And there's going to be no expectations on us, which is not a bad thing. And so let's go out and prove some people wrong. And we did. But th- that season, you know, Justin, you know, if you thought that this past season was rough, that I tell people all the time. I said, go back to 10 11. I said, that year sucked. I hated it. That's I way hated worse than, it. Way worse than those and, past and, year. There were those expectations worth there this and, year. I hate the fact that, you know, I'm not proud saying that I was on one of coaches those worst teams. I am not proud of saying that. Because again, that year, it, it almost cost me to walk away for good. It really did. I mean, it's one thing to be on one of Izzo's worst teams, but it was the contrast. It was. How everything happened. Well, but it was it was expected to, like I said. The expectations. I, I'm pretty cynical, Anthony. I know you don't know me that well, but I'm pretty <laughs> cynical. So if I'm out there saying, oh, fuck, this team's going 33-2. and two. Like, if I'm saying that, I, I, and no one called me crazy. Right. I'm Michigan fans, baby. But I, I was not like a charlatan screaming right. the, on the street corner. It was like, yeah, I could see it. Like it, it wasn't even that wild of a Because that's what everybody expected. And even having spoken with you, having spoken with Darrell about it on the show prior, I don't think you guys even now really know. It's just it, 
wasn't there for whatever mm-hmm. reason. Valenti's theory, I can't remember if it was in the same rant you're talking about post Iowa, mm-hmm. but his theory throughout that season was Izzo had his flirtation with the Cavaliers between 2010 and 2000. That was miserable too, by the way. <laughs> well, yeah, and I can't remember where that lined up with your timeline because that was right when you were coming in. No, so that was after I came in. So I came in um, the year, the season after they went to the Final Four at Ford Field. So I was redshirted. Oh, um, that's right, because you're yep, redshirt. Yep, that's so, right. But I talk about in the book how I was at um, I was at China Express in Hazlitt. Shout out to them. Best Chinese food in town in mid-Michigan. Um, I was standing in line just to get some Chinese food for dinner. And this guy walks up behind me and goes, hey, uh, is he staying or is he going? I'm yeah. like, what are you talking, I'm like, what are you talking about? Yeah. yeah, that's what I said. He yeah. goes, Izzo, is he staying or is he going? I'm like, I- honestly, sir, like, I don't know. He goes, the hell you don't. You know, probably know more than everybody else in this in this area right now. I said, honestly, I don't know. So can I just get my food and go home now? Please? I don't think, look, for the record, I don't think Tom Izzo knew. And, uh, and having spoken to people like around him, well, during Le- the LeBron time, had a lot to do with it. Well, I, LeBron's decision. Right. It, the, the decision had a lot to do so with it. So you believe that because that's what I've heard too is that Izzo was what some people say it was back channel. Some people allege there was an actual conversation. But Izzo, from what I'm told, was trying to pin down an answer from LeBron James. And had he re upped in Cleveland, Izzo would have gone, which I would not have blamed him, by the way. There, there would have been a good chance because I know— He almost went anyway without yeah, that assurance. Because from what we were told, um, LeBron's, LeBron's circle wanted Byron Scott, and which Byron Scott got the job anyway, yeah, yeah. and so it didn't matter. But that's who LeBron wanted. And so, but you know, I think Coach Izzo, I think it was us. So we had, we had a meeting with him. So, so the day, and I talk about it in the book, so we had a meeting where it was the morning after he had flown to Cleveland and Gilbert gave him the offer. We go to the office about like 6.30 in the morning and all these media trucks were parked outside the Breslin Center, man. And it, it was crazy. It was, it was like the Pope was in town or something like that. And all these media trucks were there. So we had this meeting and coach was like, yeah, I went and visited Cleveland last night and here's what they offered me. And we all just sat there in silence. We didn't know what to say. We didn't know how to react because it's like, Wow, like five years, like five years, thirty million dollars. Okay, um, what do you say? So nobody said anything. We just went to workouts, went about our day, and then we had, and then Draymond called an emergency uh, team meeting at at the uh, Claire Bell Smith Center. And Mike Garland stood up and started talking. He's like, "If you guys don't say something, like, he's gonna leave." And Draymond, she's like, "You know what? Forget this. Let's go over there. Let's go get our coach back." So we parked our cars outside the building. We're walking in and like all these cameras are like hounding us and everything, like asking us questions. We didn't say anything. And so we walk in, Coach Izzo walks in and Draymond said like, look, like we, we need you. We don't want you to leave. And so guys said their piece. I said my piece privately to Coach Izzo. So I said to him, I said, do you know why, do you know one of the reasons why I came back to Michigan State? I said, I didn't just come to Michigan State to play at Michigan State. I came here to play for you. I said, so if you leave, what, what is that? What's my dream? What, what does that accomplish my dream? It doesn't. Like, yeah, I play at Michigan State. Great, cool. But I wanted to play for you. And I've said that. I said it to him when I was eight years old. He knows that. And I don't want to say that helped him in his decision in staying. But I think it realized like how much his players really, truly cared about him. And after we got over the shock and well, everything he told us, like three days later, he said, no, I'm staying. And, you know, I think Coach Izzo said it best at his, at his press conference. He is a Spartan for life. And that's kind of where the whole term, you know, Spartan dog for life, you know, kind of all started was under him. And so that was, that was tough. I, I don't want to say, I don't think Coach Izzo's flirtation with the NBA had anything to do with that season just being that was Valenti's theory you know, yeah that that, 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 that that was that was Valenti's theory he and thought it, you guys were mad that no. you felt betrayed by the flirtation no and it wasn't a conscious choice we're gonna screw Tom Izzo and and, and you know lollygag the year right. but his theory was subconsciously it was like you know what F you Izzo you don't you dispute yeah, that I, you don't I, I that. completely dispute that it's just his theory he didn't report it right but that was his, Which, his theory now if if is if is didn't tell us what was going on then yeah maybe guys had different th- feelings but he kept us in the loop on things we didn't tell anybody in the media 
um, you know, if media asks us questions. So like when we walked into the meeting, you know, we were about to walk out. So we had our, this is like leading up to our team camps and day and night camps in Michigan State. Our managers were back in town. They had to go outside and park our cars and move them to the tunnel. So we didn't walk back out to the media. But a couple guys walked back out anyway. And, you know, our media guy was like, hey, they ask you questions. Just say you're there to get your championship rings fitted. They were like, okay, no big deal. So they just walked out and said, yep, we're here to get it. We got our championship rings fitted. We're all good. See you guys later. But I remember just like all seven of our managers taking all these car keys and like unlocking every car that's in the parking lot and moving it down the tunnel. Like that was a crazy experience. But no, the, nobody was bitter at Coach Izzo. Like nobody was upset at him. And when he came back, there was everybody was actually relieved. Because number one, I think it's because, okay, he's made his decision. That part's over. We can move on. And number two, he's here to stay. Like, he's not going anywhere. No. I mean, that, that season is, there's so much to it. And I, I think you, you filled in the blanks maybe a little better than Durrell did. But no one still even really gets it. But I, I don't think you can get it. Sometimes things right. don't make sense. They just don't click for whatever reason. I thought it was interesting that, a team with Draymond Green, who, I mean, he wasn't a senior, but he was a junior, right. would even, like, tolerate not? You know, like, I yeah. mean, I'm sorry, but Iowa was not, like, 30 points better than you. No, they weren't. Like, that should they never were. happen. Like, I, I don't know. Like, that, that the Draymond element is, I, I believe me, you can convince me that more talented guys can loaf or be out to lunch or whatever. Mm-hmm. The Draymond component is what makes it so confusing. Yeah. And he wasn't he wasn't freshman or sophomore Draymond. He was a guy that played in the Final Four as yeah. a freshman, was the, uh, probably the best player left on the 2010 team with Kalen Lucas on the sideline. Yep. I, I just, I don't get how Draymond let that happen, for lack of a better term. I, I don't know how you know that a, was allowed to happen. A leader, a leader can only do so much. Because if he doesn't have everybody following him in the right direction with him, then you can't, you all can't do it together. So, for a good example, Justin, is the reason why our team was so good my senior year in 11 and 12 was because everybody knew their role. Everybody understood their role and they played their role to the T. And they followed Draymond. We followed Austin, the, the underclassmen. I mean, Derek, Derek Nixon and I were talking about this the other day. Like, it wasn't just Draymond everybody followed, it wasn't just Austin. They followed Brandon Wood in the process. They followed me, like a guy who just was just given a scholarship, captain of the scout team. Like, huh? Like, you're going to follow me? Okay, great, cool. They followed all of us. So therefore, everybody was following each other. So that's why we were so good, because our team camaraderie was so strong that year. And we wanted to show our freshmen, Brandon Dawson, Brandon, Brandon Kearney, and Travis Trice, like, hey, this is who we are. And you guys need to continue this. And that's what they did throughout their four years, two years, three years, they were whatever, whenever they were at Michigan State. And, but that was a testament to Draymond. That was also a testament to Austin and, and myself coming together and say, hey, we're going to put Michigan State back on the map where it rightfully belongs with college basketball's elite, and we're going to go out the right way. And I remember telling Joe Rexroad, he interviewed me um, for uh, Media Day, and I mentioned how you know, the toughest team was going to win the Big Ten Championship, and I said that team's going to be us. So, you know, I remember Joe Rexford at the time. I love Joe. It's my guy. He was like, uh, you know, it's a little, uh, I don't know about that. You know, I love the enthusiasm, but that may be a little uh, too optimistic. And then senior day, we're playing Ohio State. And I said to him, I said, hey, how about the prediction, huh? We're right, uh, we're right there. <laughs> Win or lose, we're Big Ten champs. He goes, that was, that was probably the greatest prediction I've ever seen a basketball player ever make with low expectations for a team. And, but again, it was because of the camaraderie. And when a team does not have a strong camaraderie, like you can have all the leaders you want on a team, but if everybody on that team is not going to follow that leader, you're not going to go far as a team. And I think that's what happened in 10-11. In not everybody wanted to follow him. The camaraderie was not there for whatever reason. But 11-12, that camaraderie was there. We started off 0-2, but then we win the next 15. And we were stronger than ever, not just as a team, but as a Spartan family that year too. That the Big Ten championship game in the tournament in Indianapolis against Ohio State. Yes, Jared Solinger. Oh team. my goodness, that was. I think it's almost the forgotten game of the Izzo era. Like I, nobody really talks about that game. That it's I, a it classic. Was, it's it was one of the best heavyweight man favorite moments. Was actually uh, an ancillary thing. I Greg Oden was who we briefly mentioned in passing earlier was at the game, and uh, this is the sidebar. <laughs> he, was, he came in, and he was sitting 10, 10 seats over, two rows in front of me. And 
of all things, a guy's there wearing a, I think it was a Bonzi Wells <laughs> Trailblazers <laughs> jersey at the Ohio State Michigan State basketball game for the conference. A guy, I'm almost positive it was a Bonzi Wells, definitely a Portland Trailblazers jersey. Mm-hmm. The guy's a Portland Trailblazers fan. So Odin comes down. He, he was fashionably late. He comes down right. like nine minutes, you know, probably like the second TV timeout. Comes down, sits down, everyone's, hey, you know, Greg, and mostly Ohio State fans, you know, yell at him. They, he took him to the championship game mm-hmm. against Florida. They all love him, despite his NBA struggles. <laughs> this Trailblazer fan turns around and says, hey, Greg, where's your wheelchair? Oh, God. <laughs> and I swear to God, Odin just stands up, says, fuck you, oh, geez, and just sits man. back down. It was, it was, it was like, like I would not, this guy for the record is like five five, like one hundred and twenty pounds. Greg Odin, I don't like care se- how seven two, like two. I don't care how like. bad his knees are. Like <laughs> I'm just, but it was it was just bizarre. It's like I just like Greg Odin told this guy to fuck off. Like right in front of me at a Bonzi Wells jersey. He's just like, the, why is this guy even there? Like it was just, you know, oh, I would get it man. if like the tournament was in Portland, but it didn't even make sense. But like, what are the odds of Trailblazers? The guy's mad. He's a Trailblazers fan sitting there. But anyways, an interesting sidebar, but. Yeah, that was the forgotten game to me. I, I think it was the game before that Austin Thornton went off. He had kind of like a— I guess Wisconsin, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Travis, it was like a Travis Walton against USC in the 09 tournament where it's like, leading scorer, Travis Walton. It's like, the fuck? Like, Austin Thornton went off for 16? He, he, like, he did not miss a shot that game either. Oh, and they needed him. Yeah. Yeah. Because I, I remember, I think we got down early to Wisconsin. You did. We did. And then Austin went off, and then we never looked back. And we ended up winning by, like, 20-plus. Yeah, oh, you was. ran away. But that was, like, that was the turning point was Austin Thornton. Yes. Yeah. yeah. The bizarre and, the, and then the best him way. and then him and Brandon Woods saved us against Ohio State because yeah. when we went we were down like Deshaun Thomas had hit a three to put him up seven with like seven minutes to go or whatever and then we come down Austin hits a three we come down again Brandon Wood hit a jump shot we come down B Wood hit a three and we take the lead and but again like that that's how tough that team was too Justin it was like okay if we get down great cool we're good we're good. We're going to chip, chip away at it. And I think Clark Kellogg said it best in the game. It was after um, Adrian Payne dunked all over Sollinger and Thomas, and that's when I pulled out the, the Cam Newton celebration. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I did it better than Cam, by the way. <laughs> um, yeah. But, um, so after, after he dunked it, Clark Kellogg flat out said, these are two great teams. I was like, yeah. I heavyweight said, match. Heavy, uh, heavyweight was, match. I had a lot of respect for that Ohio State team. I did too. They, they had some studs on that team. Sollinger, Thomas, Buford. I mean, Aaron Kraft, like, I mean. Kraft was annoying, but uh, effect, effective. He's a little <laughs> rat, you know. The, the guy's known for his defense, man, just, like, getting on the floor, like, and just diving get, for every loose ball. Like mosquito, that. get the off, like, insect <laughs> spray. Like, get this guy away from me. He pissed me. Everybody, but that's a good thing, right? Oh, it's, yeah, it's a good it's thing. It's like Zach Novak from Michigan. It's oh. like, get this fucking rat out when, of here, please. When, when they're doing their job like that and people are saying, you know, you know, get off the court or like. You're doing a good job. Yeah, you're doing your job, yeah. obviously, and that's exactly what those two did during yeah. their careers. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's sort of like the opposite of whenever Xavier Simpson would pull for three. I'd be like, yeah, all right, like Xavier, <laughs> go go get a partner. Like, yeah, take that wide open three. Like, I, I mean, God, if the guy could throw it in the ocean in any of those three games against Cassius in his junior year, they would have won at least one of them. Oh. I mean, it's like they lose, you know, they lose by five. Xavier Simpson over eight from deep. It's like, ah, oh, thank God the guy can't shoot for shit. But yeah, it's just <laughs> sort of like the reverse of that. Now, I want to finish here in terms of the Michigan State thing. We'll get to the speed round. We talked about this a lot. And yep. there's no way, look, people that know me, I, I got paintings of Izzo over oh, here. Yeah. I got a giant mural of Izzo over there. I got a giant poster. My license plate on my truck is TM Izzo with the Michigan State logo. <laughs> so I, you're not going to get an objective Tom Izzo take from me. But I, I try. You know, I try. Tom Izzo is my dream interview, by the way. Mm-hmm. I mean, you were second. But oh, thank you. Yeah, Tom Izzo. <laughs> I would take Tom Izzo over like the president like to sit in that chair one day. Big Tom Izzo fan. But I, I do think no person is beyond reproach. But there's some criticism of him I don't really buy. And maybe it is my bias. And I concede that up front. That's why I bring it up. I don't mm-hmm. want anyone saying, oh, he's a Spartan homer. Because I kind of am. But I try to be objective. But I really don't think this particular criticism is fair. Tom Izzo's polarizing on a national level. Michigan State fans, mostly beloved. But national level, he's polarizing. You played for two years with the guy. You went up to him as an eight-year-old. 
You had a relationship through your father with him. You know him better than guys that maybe played four years for him. Yep. He's been raked over the coals several times for one thing in particular. These intense, fiery interactions oh, with players. Yeah. Yep. So we're going to play just a, a little mashup, and we could have done a three-hour compilation. <laughs> but the two, the two in recent memory, 2019, and in the most recent uh, NCAA tournament, 2021, with uh, the Gabe Brown incident following the Aaron Hen- Henry incident from 2019. So the last two NCAA tournaments with 2020 being canceled, obviously, have gotten Tom Izzo into theoretically hot water. We'll debate whether that has any merit. Mm-hmm. So w- let's play just uh, for a little bit of context. We'll play that and we'll get to it. Animation here from Coach Tom Izzo. Well, you would freshman Aaron Henry. You would think on a 10-0 run, Tom Izzo would be happy. Was he out of line? Absolutely 100%. He is out of line. That is not coaching Skip Bayless. That's bullying Shannon Sharp. It was called on the floor as a long two. And again, Michigan State, just some infighting. And well, I tell you, Aaron Henry is all over Tom Izzo. That- so don't give me that because everybody loves him. You excuse behavior. Yep. Because there's sometimes that behavior, even though you can love someone, their behavior is out of line. Yep. He was out of line on this, Skip. I'll clutch those pearls, Mr. Shannon Sharp. I will say the most upsetting <laughs> uh, part of that second clip to me <laughs> is the painful reminder that we were up by 11 and a half against you. Oh, see, God. Like, Don't that, go there, that's, man. That's Don't far more there. offensive to the senses. <laughs> that's far more upsetting to me than the interaction with Gabe Brown. But again, I, I put it up front. Look, I, I admit it. Most people don't. These huge Michigan fans that won't criticize anything, and they, they pretend like there's no tint of, of uh, sort of a shot against their credibility based on their fan. Mm-hmm. I, I admit it up front. That's why I started there. But I really don't see this as the issue so many do. But I think you are uniquely qualified to speak on it, not just because of your relationship with them. I could have that same question posed to any of his former players, mm-hmm. and they'd be very uniquely positioned. But you even more so. Because Rob Parker used the term, reacting to the Aaron Henry exchange, he used the term bullying. That's bullying. I just read your childhood life story mm-hmm. in the last four days. You're a guy who played for this man for two years and also has a history of guys bullying you, picking on you, being uh, unkind to you, mm-hmm. to say the least. I think you're the best person to answer this question. Yeah. Playing for Tom is, though. What do you make of this? Is this criticism fair? Well, what, what's your take on it? No, it's not fair. And, you know, the Rob Parker segment and Shannon Sharp, like, you heard, you, you heard me. I laughed at that because Rob Parker brings up bullying. First of all, if that's bullying, I don't know what is then. I really don't because, you know, the difference is between somebody like me and a Shannon Sharp and a Skip Bayless and a Rob Parker. How many days a week are they at practice? How many days a year have they come? How many times has Shannon Sharp been to East Lansing? How many times has Skip Bayless been to our to the Breslin Center? None. And so I've always told people, like, if you're not around our program, if you've never seen our practices before, then what are you talking about? You you've only seen like a couple of incidences. Now, when when it happened with Aaron Henry, like again, I was like, okay, that's is. Like, that's how intense he is. Like, he's intense because he wants you to be perfect. He wants you to be perfect on offense, run the plays perfect. Set a ball screen perfect, play defense perfect, to communicate perfect, rebound perfect. And what you saw in those clips there were major errors and mistakes by Gabe Brown and Aaron Henry. Aaron messed up communication on defense. Coach Izzo got on him about it. It was in front of the whole world, though. Uh, Gabe Brown, Malik Hall, miscommunication. He got on Gabe about it. The only thing I did not like was the jersey grabbing. That's it. That's it. But everything else, I was cool with. Because I'm like, you know what? That's his intensity. It's who he is. And, but Tom Izzo, though, this is the same guy who, when I transferred from Grand Valley State, we had a one-on-one meeting. This is the same guy who flat out said to me, hey, here's the deal. You know, just because you have autism does not mean I'm going to treat you any differently. I'm going to treat you and coach you like how I've coached and treated every other player that's come before and after you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to push you to a limit that you've never been pushed to in your entire lifetime. You know what my response to that was, Justin? 
I said, coach, that's all I want. I want to be like every other player that's come here. And I want you to coach me like you've coached every other player. Because that's what I wanted. Because when you sign the dot, when you sign your letter of intent, or when you sign those papers to transfer to Michigan State, you know what you're getting into. And I think Draymond said it best. When you come to Michigan State, you come to Michigan State as a kid. When you leave, you leave as a man because of what that coaching staff does for you, how what they do for you, how they teach you. Like Tom Izzo, Justin didn't just teach me about basketball. He taught me about life. He taught me how to treat others off the court. He, told, he taught me how to represent yourself, not just represent your family and your community and your hometown, but how you represent a university. So yeah, I graduated from Michigan State nine years ago, but guess what? I still represent Michigan State University each and every single day because if I ever got in trouble for doing something stupid, which you know I'll, I'll never do in my life because I got a wife and two kids at home that I love near and dear to my heart, and I, the last thing I want to do is hurt them, like he always taught me to represent yourself. Because if you do something stupid, not only is that a black mark on you, it's a black mark on the program, it's a black mark on your community and family, and it's a black mark on this university. That's what he taught me. You represent everybody around you to the highest ability. That's what he taught me. And stuff like that, it held us accountable. It really did. Because it taught us, you make a mistake, okay, cool, you're going to hear the raft. Don't make that same mistake twice so you get it worse. So, I, and so like when you look at um, media members like Graham Couch, Chris Solari, Joe Rexrode, um, Matt Charbonneau, they've been around our practices. They've covered the team. They've seen what goes on in practices whenever they're there. So, you know, whenever stuff like that happens, our media folks are just like, huh? Eh, We've seen, we've seen it before. It's old hat. It, exactly. Yeah, but exactly. you're in this national context. I mean, Draymond Green, I'll paraphrase, but he had a tweet because, I mean, Twitter was going yeah. nuts, especially yep. after the Gabe Brown incident because everyone is still mostly at home from COVID and just sitting right. on board. But people were going nuts, but Draymond chimed in at halftime, like right after that happened yep. with Gabe Brown. And again, paraphrase, but it was something like, Another day in the Michigan State office. Just like another day at the like, office, right? <laughs> like, well, I don't know what you guys are so upset about, but what I said in real time was like, hey, you know, Michigan fans mostly in terms of locally, mm -hmm. like, thank you for your concern for the well being of our players. We appreciate it. We're good. They're okay. <laughs> like, I'm glad you guys are upset and the, the talking heads are upset. You know who doesn't give two hoots in hell? The supposed victim, the supposed victim, the mm -hmm. players. Yeah. They don't give a shit. Like Gabe Brown, no big deal. Aaron Henry, two years prior, no, I loved it. I need yeah. that. I, he was right. I, I, I screwed up. That's the culture. Yeah. So, and, and it's a consensual culture, by the way. Mm -hmm. it, 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 this isn't like, yeah, people say, oh, there's a power. I, I, I'm with you on the touching. I, I wouldn't get into the touching. Yeah. But beyond that, and it's not, come on. It's not like the guy punched him. Like, he tugged down his jersey. It, it's not like. Shouldn't do it. But. It's not like what Bobby Knight did, like, 15 years ago to a player where you know, he got got his player under the chin yeah. and everybody like if Bobby Knight did that today, he, he would have been fired. Yeah. He would have been fired easily. Coaches have. I'm blanking on someone just got fired for handling players. Who was it? I can't remember. College basketball coach. Oh, but man. you can't do it. You can't do it anymore. No, you can't. And yeah. especially this day and age with social media, because, you know, and and Tom Izzo, like like we talked about, is one of he, he's one of the top three basketball coaches in the entire country. You know, maybe top ten in the world. Maybe top. Yeah, you know, I'll say I'll say he's top five in the world, in my opinion. I'm, I'm not biased or anything, right? Yeah. Um, but you know, there is a huge microscope under him, and he knows that. And people will pick out anything to try to give him criticism. And this is obviously one of those things. But like us former players, like it's not just me. It was Gary Harris. It was Jaron Jackson Jr. It was Kelvin Torbert. It was Draymond. We all came to his defense because it's like Scott Van Pelt. Um, you know, Scott Van Pelt's like had a great two minute session about it. And he talked about how, you know, Tom Izzo doesn't have a one year problem. He has a four year problem because he has a bunch of guys past and present who are loyal to him because of what he does for them. And Scott Van Pelt hit it right on the nail. He said, obviously, they're not concerned. They're not worried about it. So. Why are you worried about yeah. it when it's not your concern? 
stop being concerned with things that don't concern that don't involve you because we're not like it was it was along the lines of that so i'm definitely he perfect. nailed it, it yeah, and that was did. a great viral response to yep. the sort of counter viral yep and you know. this is a big 10 guy too this is a maryland grad and but scott van Pelt has covered college basketball enough to understand michigan state's culture and that's why he gave the shout out he did, which, you know, Scott Van Pelt, like I loved him before then. I love him even more now and I respect him even more because of what he did. But he was right. Like that loyalty we have for Coach Izzo, it's because of everything he taught us as players, but what he taught us as men too. Because again, back to that phrase, you come in as a boy, you come as a little kid, you walk out as a man because of what he teaches you about life. And what he did for me, and it was not easy, Justin, because I had fans who actually thought that my dad paid off Tom Izzo for me to be on the team. Same and people that said you, you faked the autism, right? Yeah, it's yeah. probably the same people yeah. and the same folks who said, like, I couldn't, I didn't play a minute at Grand Valley State, so I left Michigan State, which definitely was not true. I was the sixth man off the bench my sophomore year. Things just didn't work out in other different ways, which you can go read, you know, read, read, read about it in center. Right, the, the You'll book, hear it book, all. Books right right there, baby. Shameless plug. Shameless plug. I'm fantastic not afraid, not afraid. book. Um, but yeah, so, but this is the same guy that prepared me for, you're going to get backlash because you're father. People are going to say you're here because of him. And Tom Izzo had a great quote at our team banquet, and he, and he said it to the media too. Anthony Ianni came to Michigan State as Greg Ianni's son. Now he's just Anthony Ianni. I love it. Love it. That, and that's the guy. So in, really, in the whole world, it was everybody against... Izzo with the only people in his corner, Spartan Nation. Yep. And uh, Scott Van Pelt and Stephen A. Smith. Like that was yeah. the me the me because Stephen A. took up for him oh, too. Oh yeah, he did. Yeah. Steve, Stephen A. was like, I, I don't see what the big deal is. Stephen A.'s a big Izzo guy. Like yeah. he thinks Izzo's the best coach in college yeah. basketball. Now so. again, Justin, like if somebody said, asked me today, would you want your kids playing for somebody like that? I'm like, yeah, you know what, I would. Because you want to know why? My kids will be held accountable, yeah. and they will be better as a person, not just as a player, but they'll be better as a person because of that. Well, I'm full circle on Izzo and what you were saying much earlier in this show. The, Gonta, you, when I asked you what advice you would give yeah. to someone, a you know, friend raising a kid, don't lower the bar. Yeah. Izzo his, said, I'm his not— His bar is right I'm, up here, man. But, and he was saying that, and he wrestled with that with, maybe not you, but with Cassius Winston in the wake of his— brother's tragic death yep. or, and he openly he said this at press conferences repeatedly it's like i don't know what to do because it's yeah. like i i gotta be the worst person on earth if i don't at least consider how i'm talking to a guy whose brother just died right exactly it, like it's but at the same time am i doing him a disservice if i just if i know, lower the bar if i pat him on the butt yeah. There honestly is no answer to that. Like, mm -hmm. you know, if you were to ask me, oh, how should Izzo have handled that? I can't really say, oh, yeah, go easy on him. And I can't see myself saying, oh, pretend nothing happened because right. we're human beings. Cassius Winston, I mean, you may be the nicest guy I know. He's top five, like, that I've met. Yeah. Like, you know, it's, it's, it's a tough job. I, I, I love Izzo. I'll fight for him. I'll defend him against all <laughs> – Spear throwers out there that are throwing spears at him. Anyone with the, the blades out, anyone throwing any, any pitchforks in the air, uh, I'm going to defend him. But I, I think he is a great guy. I'm not just saying that because I'm dying to have him in the chair you're sitting in now. I just I would send my kid there in a second. I, just, yeah. I would. I'm with you. So we'll wrap there other than our little speed round. We talked about it before, so yep. we'll get to it. We're going to go quick. You know, you, we're going to be on the ball here because I've kept you for two hours. You got two young kids, man. I feel bad. Let's get to it. That's all good, man. <laughs> this is the speed round. We got six for you tonight. I'm excited. Oh, boy. So, we'll, you know, we'll go as long as you want, but, you know, <laughs> you, you know the rules. We talked about it. So, we'll start here. A little bit light, totally unrelated to basketball, but certainly something to do with our beloved Michigan State. Anthony's death row East Lansing meal. So... <laughs> I'll phrase it, <laughs> and this and half the places from the time because we graduated oh. like the same year, yeah, like, like, literally the same year. I yeah. I walked in 2012 like you did. Yep. So I mean, half those places are gone. Like, yeah, so they are. They so are, man. You are welcome to revive Gumby's Pizza if that's your thing. Rest <laughs> or Menas. I mean, but you're on death row. 
East Lansing is cooking. A restaurant in East Lansing is cooking your death row meal. What are, what are you thinking? <laughs> What's your death row meal? Where you, are you going? You already said it. Mena's buffalo dub with some soup. With, I was with, a with CT, their, with I was their a CT si- dub guy you, myself. You know, I could, I could. You can go with any dub, but yeah. like the buffalo chicken dub with like some chicken noodle soup. Oh. That, that was my go-to. The, but, uh, I'm not knocking the buffalo dub. I went there a couple times. The CT dub was great. Though. It, it was. How did that place not work? Oh man, <laughs> what, what? I I, I tried to go back to East Lansing like before the pandemic, and then I was like, man, I shouldn't go from. I can go from Menas right now, and I looked it up, and it said it was closed. I'm like. How? Man, my heart was ripped out. I mean, imagine like a town that had one gas station. And, and then the gas like, station the closes. Gas station clo- <laughs> it's like, how did that not work? Like, how did you go out of business? And there, like, was, like, there was like four of them in town. I, well, and they're it, all gone. It, how? How did oh. the one right in the heart of downtown East Lansing, you're, you're, it's an affordable, delicious uh, Treat. It's just, it's just, oh. It's wrapped. They're grilling it. All, everything's fresh. And, oh, it, it, it's the best. And, and it was perfect at three o'clock in the morning too on those late nights at Harper's and Rick's. Man, I'll oh. tell you what, man. That Menos is rare because it was one of those you could have it on noon on a Saturday and it was awesome. But it was also the best drunk food ever. It hit the spot. Which is it it's hit weird. The spot because like I mean, look, I, we all like a good. Well, I don't know if you're a vegetarian, but most of us like a good steak from oh, yeah, now for and then. Sure, for sure. But it'd be fucking weird to get like a, a bone in ribeye at 2 a.m. when you're drunk. I just, I just get me fucking Taco Bell. <laughs> but like Meadows actually was kind of like a crossover that it was like actually, it was like good quality. It was, yes. But you could, all, it was also great at 2 30 in the morning. But rest in peace to the CT Seriously. Dub. That's just depressing. But Meadows, that's a great answer. We got to bring it back somehow, man. Seriously, come on. What are we doing up there? Like, what, <laughs> like we needed a third McDonald's. All right, moving on. Hitting Grand Valley State a little bit. I look. I've been there once. Not a fan. I gotta admit. Maybe I'm a bad guy. Just <laughs> it, and then there's, there's nothing wrong with it. It's just like, do people have fun up here? You were there a couple years. Like, tell me about Grand Valley. Do you I, like it there? You left, dude. You know, like that dude, much. I just in the five five years I had in college, the two years I had at Grand Valley State were the best years I had in college. What? I uh, no joke. You were on a one seed. Championship Michigan State basketball team. Well, here's why. Here's why I love. Well, first of all, I hold a special place in my heart for Grand Valley State because the relationships and the friendships I made there, I still continue to this day, That's were just fair. phenomenal. The the student athletes there, a lot like a lot like Michigan State, are family. Everybody's so tight. But like everything was right there. Like if you wanted to go to a party somewhere at Copper Beach apartment complexes, all you had to do was just drive a half mile down the road to get there. I heard, or, they, I heard they didn't drink there. That was the rumor in that, East Lansing that, was like, was, it's a dry campus. That was the rumor that that's people, people told. That's what, that was the rumor people told me that in high school. They're like, oh, I don't know why would you go there. It's a dry campus. It's, it's, said. it's boring. I'm going to tell you right now, it's a complete opposite. Really? It oh, is a complete opposite, there, man. So. And, and th- there was a place called Taco Bob's. Taco Bob's like right there on campus. And you talk about having good 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning food, Taco Bob's hit the spot. Now, quick little funny story for you. So they had a taco challenge. You had to eat 10 tacos, soft or hard shell, and if you ate all of them, you can sign your name on the wall. Oh, how many but. times is Andy Isaac on that wall? <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. Andy, Andy would have been on there like 100 <laughs> yeah. times. He would have been wallpapered with his name on it. <laughs> so, I got, so I did it once. I, had, I, ate, I got done with my first five tacos in like three minutes, and then I took my time after that. And then this is after I announced my decision where I was going to transfer to. So I signed the wall. I signed it autographed it 44 and then i said go green exclamation point exclamation point smiley face i love that <laughs> is that place still open no it's and gone why is that closed? all the classic places are gone poncheros man. Uh, on grand river closed oh geez how does poncheros close i mean every night they're, they're lined up to the parking lot i live two man. blocks away the line ended in my driveway like I mean, oh. come on what is going on with east lansing everything everything's closing i don't i don't get it anyway yeah. we'll move on <laughs> We've talked about a lot of these guys. Your nicest Michigan State teammate. I have no I don't, any consideration how they were on the court. Just the nicest guy. You're grabbing a beer with someone. Who's your pick? Nicest guy you played with? Austin Thornton. Austin Thornton. Hands down. A- ATs had my back from day one, and and we we golf all the time in the summer, and you know we bet sushi dinners and lunches on the side. You know, loser has to pay. So he's. He's uh, had to pay for the last few, so. Well, tell him, <laughs> tell him thanks for the Wisconsin game in 2012. I got I pr- you. Man. I appreciate it. Let him <laughs> I got know. You. Uh, moving on. Opposing player you respected the most. Just you're, you're watching, uh, watching film. You're prepping. Who's the guy that you just that you actually you know that your team played against? Who you respect the most? 
Oh, I threw man. Trey Burke up there because he was the Michigan player I respected the most. I'm not trying to my, taint the jury pool here. My, my baby cousin would appreciate you for that, by the way. Um. <laughs> I, I Trey Burke, fucking hate him, but I, I just <laughs> I, I'm sorry what heck he of, did. Heck to, of a player, man. What he did at, in at the Chrysler Center. Um, I'm not going to talk about it with what, um, what he did at center court at the end of that game. So I actually interviewed him on my on my own podcast, uh, the Center Podcast, Robbie Hummel, Purdue. Oh, good announcer too. He one of my favorite. The only reason why, like he, I got through Michigan State games so many last year because just listening to him. And I told him that on the podcast. And but just like what Robbie went through and how he was able to rebound back his senior year, averaging like seventeen and like nine. Is he like an Achilles? I I can't remember. ACL so it was his ACL. ACL. So okay. my red my junior year was ACL, and then going to my redshirt junior year, they had all those guys back. And then he told me on the podcast he tore it again. And then he was done. He was out for like a year and a half, almost two years. Was it Etwan Moore? Etwan Moore, Jawan Johnson, Johnson, like all those guys. Yeah, like, JJ Johnson. And, and I tell Robbie, like, had his team, had he not torn his ACL in 09 10, we would have been playing Purdue in the Final Four or for a national championship. They had a great team. They, they, they were stacked, man. But Robbie, Robbie to this day will always be um, the number one guy I've always respected on an opponent. Um, his program years after he left should have gone to the final four in 2019. I'm still not sure how that happened against Virginia, but oh, I man. digress. <laughs> As, Virginia is the luckiest national champion ever. Every three games in a row, like weird stuff. Oh just, yeah. It, that was it the was, narrowest. It was crazy, man. It's like, God forbid Michigan State gets one of these breaks. Our best player tears his ACL the year before we run into the best team in 15 years in 09. It's like, Ugh. I know it's been wonderful at Michigan State, but everything has been, earned i mean there's been no the oh, yeah. one break we've ever gotten was when northern iowa popped kansas but i'm sorry i'm supposed to thank you the same weekend that kaylin lucas the best player in the conference got hurt like right. i don't i don't feel that lucky <laughs> like I, i'm glad farouk manash hit the three uh, but i'm sorry i'm not gonna praise god the same day i lost my best player to a torn achilles no, anyway guess. moving on <laughs> You can change one thing about Tom Izzo. I'm going to make you do it. Oh, you no. loved him. You, you, you defended him on the biggest <laughs> criticism. It, it can be a small thing, a big thing. It's just like, you know, this one thing, coach, I love you, but God, I hated that you chewed that gum. I didn't like it. It can be as trivial or serious as you want. You can change one thing about the guy. What do you change? I'm putting you on the oh, spot. Oh, no. No one's perfect, Anthony. Come on. What? I won't show him this clip. Oh man, one thing I wish I could change about coach is um you know what, not not when I was playing, but today, um I kind of wish he'd go back to the old uh, suit and tie look. That's fair. Honestly, yeah. honestly because like when he first did the no tie and just the un, you know, unbuttoned top collar, I go, that's that's just weird cuz I've always seen coach is in like full suit and tie. I'm like I want to see him go back to that. Is that honestly, man? That's the only thing I would change about him is make having him go back to the old, old, old school suit and tie. I, I look. can't knock him though, man, because I'd be a hypocrite. I'll tell you what. I used to wear a suit and tie every day to work, nursing home administrator. Mm-hmm. COVID hit, and we were it got so bad where I we were literally moving like I was as a manager moving residents, which would normally be like a nurse's position. Yeah, moving people just left. Nurses were like, I don't, I mean, "We're all gonna die." I mean, no, this is early, like March, right, 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 right. So we got to a point where the management used to wear suits and ties. Right. Now we're not going to be in our nice suit and tie, like getting coughed on, like getting thrown up on or whatever. So we started wearing scrubs those first couple months. Yeah. And then we eventually got into like kind of, okay, khakis and a quarter zip, like the Mel Tucker quarter zip. <laughs> and now we haven't had a COVID case in the building in months and I'm still wearing the quarter zip. So I, 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 I should be back in the suit and tie, Anthony, but I'm not. The quarter zip, you know, just like this. I, that was spiritual. I have the quarter zip at work, but um, I, I can't, I can't uh, forego the quarter zip. Once you go quarter zip or polo, it's tough to go back to the suit and tie. Oh, I'll yeah. defend them there. Oh, yeah. But I, no, I agree. I, I, you know, there's a soldier who hates me, a Michigan State blogger. That guy, like, if I died in a car wreck, he'd throw a parade. He hates me. But he's a big... Tom Izzo should wear a suit and tie. I'm with you. I like the look. We'll finish here. This is the third time I'm rehashing this, Anthony. There's no way I wasn't going to bring it back for your appearance. And this is our last one. So this is something I've had on the show a couple of times. I've thrown it out to David Klein. I've thrown it out to Spartan Hoops uh, DK on Twitter. Mm-hmm. I, I've thrown it out to Matt Sheehan. I've thrown it out to Connor Muldowney. This is my all-time, we'll call it Justin's all-time, Izzo era MSU lineup. Now, here was the parameter. You're going into a hypothetical NCAA tournament, so you got to win six games. Yep. 
This is not a one-off. This isn't a 35-game season. This is, I got to win six games. Who am I taking? And I do think that context frames the answer. Right. My lineup, because not everyone is watching, for those that are listening, and uh, as a reminder, I got Mateen Cleaves as my point guard. This is right off the bat. I, this is a controversy in some circles. Mateen at, <laughs> at, at the one. I got Jay Rich, Jason Richardson as my uh, two guard. I got Denzel Valentine as my small forward. I got your pal Draymond Green at the four. I got Xavier Tillman playing center. And my six man off the bench, Gary Harris. Now, right off the bat, because I know everyone's going there, mm-hmm. I know my team is very small. I, I get it. My tallest guy is like 6'8. And that's if you believe Tillman is 6'8. Some people right. have him at 6'7. <laughs> it's a short team. <laughs> but my logic is all six of those guys defend well. They're either A plus defenders or at worst like a B plus defender. Mm-hmm. All six will make an open shot if they're open. You leave any of those six guys open from three, money. Yeah. All six. So you got six great defenders. You got multiple good passers. Draymond, elite. Yep. Mateen was the best in the conference for years. Elite. Denzel, elite. Mm-hmm. Gary Harris can pass. So you got playmakers, shooting, defense. I'm willing to give up a little size. What did you think? And Ben, if you can throw that back up there, I'll get one more look. We grade my lineup. Is that an A plus or is that an A minus? It's certainly not in the B range. And would you make any changes <laughs> to that? Anybody that ever played for Izzo? And this is college. NBA means nothing. So I would give it an A minus. Okay. What do you not like? So I don't like Mateen Clay as a point guard because I'm putting Magic Johnson that point guard. But he didn't play for time as well. Oh, shoot. Never mind. You're right. All right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Man. All You're right. going to the Judd Heath Dude, Believe me. Believe me. That, this that's, was that's a, the all time program. You, you, Matt, you think I'd leave Magic <laughs> off? Oh, if I left Magic off and you were eligible, it should be an F. I, guess, I don't care what the rest so, of So, um, can I see that one more yeah, time? Yeah, yeah. Throw it back up. Throw it back up. This is, I'll, I'll tell you, I'll, I'll give you the, the Cliff's notes of the criticism I got. The, the two biggest criticisms I got were having Mateen over Winston. Mm-hmm. People wanted Winston. I think it's a little bit of recency bias. Right. My argument was, if I need a point guard to carry a team, right. I want Cassius Winston. Winston can do more. Yep. He can carry a team. This context, I want the leader of the team, the point guard, to just make sure everyone's engaged. Yeah. Winston can do more, can score more, was more dynamic in a lot of ways. I don't need that with this team. Right. And he'd be a hell of a pick. It's not like, I mean, it's 1A, 1B. But that was the big criticism. The other one that I heard the most was, and this was honestly for me a harder cut than Winston, was no Morris Peterson. I really struggled. If I could change anything, if I had to, I'd probably take out Gary Harris for Mo Pete as my sixth man. People said take Jay Rich out. There's no way. Jay Rich is on the team. So here's, here's what I would do. I would put Cassius in there over Mateen. Okay. I would put um, Mo Pete as shooting guard because, you know, and the, actually, no, let me flip that. I'm going to put Denzel at shooting guard. Okay. I'm going to put Mo Pete at, at uh, small forward, keep Draymond at power forward, keep X at center, have Jaron Jackson Jr. as a six man. Okay. That's a hell of a lineup. I mean, you know, Jaron Jackson Jr., a little, I mean, this is an, an affectionate one. A little bit of a goofball, like kind of a silly guy. <laughs> I think people do forget, though, like he won Big Ten Defensive Player of the Year, did he not? Am I making yeah, it up? Yeah, no, he like, did. And, and, that's, and that's, why, that's why I would have him, you know, come in for X because obviously, you know, we, we saw X. X can do it all. He can play defense, play offense. But having, like, you know, Jaron come in for, like, exa- have, him, have him come in for X, you know, for a def- as a defensive specialist, but at the same time, he can hit the occasional three, he can hit jump shots and make moves in the post. So having Jaron as that six man off the bench, you know, for like X and how about this too? You could have him go in for for Draymond and X can move up to the power forward and Jaron can be at the center. So could the, you imagine a front court of Draymond and Tillman? Oh my like those guys, gracious. it is like Ugh. the Einstein and like I I I mean, who's the second smartest guy ever? Like Tesla, maybe? <laughs> I 
it's like, they, they, like oh no, so. like it's like, two, like the two smartest, highest IQ players I've ever seen in college, like mm. next to each other. And they're, not that they're not skilled, but like right. those guys are savants. Those guys yeah. are Will Hunting level uh, basketball IQ. To have both those guys next to each other it would just be awesome. It's such a dream world. And we only missed it by what? Five years, six years? Yeah, we did, man. It, it oh. wasn't that far off. It would have been fun. <laughs> yeah. So just last thing before we move on. You said Jaron Jackson is your sixth man. Yes. Did you at least consider Ben Carter in that spot? Oh, God, man. <laughs> Come on now. <laughs> we'll, talk, we'll, talk, we'll talk about that after. Yeah, right? Syracuse nightmares all over again, oh, man. man. Come on. We'll talk about things haunting me. <laughs> well, I'll talk about that with you after. I mean, that's, we, we've run like over two hours, man. But I got to say, your book is awesome. Thank you. I loved having you. And I had... A hundred things. I prepped the show and a hundred things that I cut. And this always happens because mm-hmm. I got a big mouth in and I got big <laughs> eyes. I got a big appetite for this stuff. I love doing it. I'd love to have you back. Absolutely. I want to, I want to let you run the circuit, do your thing. I know you're in high demand. I'm not going to ask you back next week. Let's come back in a couple months, maybe college basketball season. Yeah. I want, I want to hear about your story. Uh, by then, you'll have been interviewed by Colin Coward, I'm sure. Hopefully. Uh, yeah, it's a <laughs> knock on wood for you. But I'd love to have you back, and I want to hit some of the small stuff from 2012. I want to talk about what happened with that uh, Rick Pitino game out in Phoenix. Uh, I, we're not getting into it. Uh, don't remind me. <laughs> I, cut, I, I cut that because that was on my sheet. I'm like, oh, yeah, Draymond Green, the ultimate guy to break the press. I was so confident. I was in Phoenix for six hours. I'll tell you that story next time. Absolutely. But I, I flew to Phoenix, had a hotel room for three nights. I'm like, I'm in. Like, we're going to take down Peyton C. Then it didn't work out. But <laughs> anyway, so it was awesome to have you, man. I really honestly applaud you. I touched on a little bit with the connection with my godson, uh, my nephew, uh, some of my best friends. I mean, I've had Chris Castellani, very famous now, mm-hmm. um, you know, of, of Tiger Twitter now, Barstool openly on the spectrum has talked about it yep. uh, on my show has talked about it publicly on his account. It really hits home for me. So like what you're doing is cool and wonderful anyway, but just on a personal level, like I, I appreciate what you're doing. Thank you. Cause I think it takes a lot of guts to be out there on the, on the front lines of any battle. Yours is a worthy one, man. It really is. And uh, there's a lot of people out there and you were one of them as a kid that suffered that didn't need to, mm-hmm. that, that struggled more than they needed to, not out of anybody's malice, but because we didn't know. Right. And you're pushing back on that and you know, creating, not, you know, awareness is an overrated term, but actual knowledge, actionable knowledge. So right. uh, I applaud you for Michigan State, man. I'm proud that you're associated with this university. Thank I think you. you're a great ambassador. And like I said, I'd like to have you back anytime. You're always welcome. Hey, man, if, if you just want to come on and talk, just call me, man. Yeah. The seat's always <laughs> open for you. I, I don't want to bug, that, I don't want to bug you. I want to give you a couple <laughs> months off because I'm a lot to take, man. I appreciate it, Justin. It's been an honor, man. And, and like I said, before we came on the show, like I said, this is the coolest, greatest man cave basement yeah. I've ever seen in my life, man. So thank you so much for having me on. It's, it's been a pleasure. pleasure. It's my pleasure, man. It's just, until, my, until my brother invites you over, then you're going to be like, this, <laughs> this, this is the, the podunk, terrible man man cave. It's the worst thing you've ever seen. Because his my, <laughs> mine looks like the uh, elevator room going to his uh, chateau. It, it's not impressive. He's got he's got a cooler collection than I do. He's got he's got a nicer design, but he doesn't have a beautiful studio. No, not like this, man. No, this does, is awesome. Yeah, he does not have the studio. So everything else is better. But I got I got my cameras. Man, I so. love it, man. And he does not have a a replica Paul Bunyan trophy. No, nope. so yeah, Paulie so, B. So he he may still win the title, but I I'm like the British in the Revolutionary War. I won a couple battles. <laughs> yeah, you know, I can hang my hat on some things. I'll hang my hat. Right on top of Paul Bunyan's head over my shoulder. There you go. It was great to have you. I want to thank our producer, Ben Augusta. This guy's the man. You're going to get to know him if you come through here more. Absolutely. I, I don't try to pump him up too much, though, because like he's really good. He already got hired from uh, by 97.1 through his connection here. Okay. I'm worried he's going to get more and more calls. Like I love my sponsors, but i got to start jacking my rates up. If he starts getting more phone calls, Anthony, <laughs> I might be hitting you up for some of that book money, my man. I'm telling All you. Right. So, right, welcome anytime. <laughs> Appreciate the audience. we got a great uh, couple weeks coming ahead. Nobody uh, really listens to this all at the same time every time. So I'm not going to tell you that there's a big game for Michigan State football tomorrow, but let's just say sometime in the mm-hmm. next, either today or tomorrow or yesterday, there was a big Michigan State <laughs> basketball game, or football game, rather, against Northwestern. I'm excited. 
We have Chris Solari coming pretty soon. We're supposed to get a date pinned down with Chris. So I'm talking to him. We have uh, Becca Polanski, the rescheduled uh, interview that I was really looking forward to last month. She works with convicts in prison, Anthony. That's going to be oh, interesting. Wow. She's a clinical psychologist that works with like people that hack up their wives and put them in boxes and tries to like rehabilitate them. Wow. This is like some David Fincher 7 Brad Pitt Morgan Freeman shit that she's trying to like cure these people. I'm fascinated. That's coming wow. up. That's I think that's going to be next week. We'll get to it. I got to say Barton Nation, I'm a believer in Mel Tucker. So get your cigars out, get your aviators. Tuck coming, baby. Tuck is coming. And if I look silly in three years because he's winning the title at Alabama or whatever, I don't care. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I, he's on the wall three times. I'm in. I'm in. I'm excited. Big football season ahead. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you again to Anthony Iani. Buy this book. I'm, tell, I'm not going to lie. I shoot my audience straight. This book is great. Here, I'll hold it up. This book is great. First 100 pages are tough, man, like in a good way. Yeah. Like it's just it's, it's a harrowing tale. It was. It was hard for me to get through just as someone that knows your reputation and how beloved you are and uh, never heard a bad word about you. And it was a tough read for those just because I felt bad. Mm -hmm. I really liked getting, I'm looking forward to finishing it, like getting into the Izzo stuff and that whole Cleveland Cavalier flirtation. Honestly, you can hate sports and not give two hoots in hell about Michigan State. Books is awesome. It's a great life story. So highly recommend it. And I'm looking forward to it, man. We are going to be giving away some of these books. Hey. If your publisher's not going to yell at me. Um, <laughs> so we're, we'll be announcing that on Twitter. Check me out at Darko State News for that. We're going to be giving away some copies of Centered. And I'm looking forward to having you back, Anthony. This is the Spiro Avenue Show. Justin Spiro. Go green, Anthony, tomorrow. Go white, brother. Love you, man. See you, Spartan Nation. Go to Evanston. Do the business. Thank you. We're out. <laughs>